This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 272 of the program. Today is Friday, January 8th, and this is our very first episode of 2021, and already we have quite a bit to talk about. But of course, before we get to the politics, I want to take some time to thank all of the folks who make this show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increase the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes... Three Duan, Alicia Lisi, Amanda Brown, April Alatore, Bonnie Verhunts, Brian Wagner, Christian LaSalle, Crowded Crow, Diana Labonte, Donald Rolls, Gerard Ruiz Toruya, Glenn Bloke, Jen M, Jenna Nix, Merrick Moses, Mr. Anderson, Q the Funky Homo Sapien, Robert Thurston, Stefan C, Ty the Millennial, Warren C, and Y. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com slash support, patreon.com slash humanistreport, or by clicking join underneath any one of our YouTube videos. You can also support us by watching all of our content on Means TV. You can get the app in the iOS and Android stores. So this week... We've already got so much to talk about, I don't even know where to begin, so uh, here's what we've got on the agenda for today's show. We'll talk about the drama that unfolded over the holidays with the left when it comes to force the vote. Also, Donald Trump encouraged Georgia's Secretary of State, Brad Raffensperger, to quote-unquote find the votes that he needs to steal the election. The United States has lost their extradition case against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, and we learned that there will be no charges filed against the police officer who shot Jacob Blake in the back seven times. We'll also talk about the far-right podcast hosts who are spreading conspiracy theories about COVID-19 and now explicitly encouraging their viewers to defy COVID lockdown orders. And we'll also talk about the lies that Senator Josh Hawley spread about Antifa. He claims that uh, they vandalized his property and tried to break into his house, but a video of the actual protest event proves that he's lying. We will also talk about the absolutely insane story of the pro-Trump mob that stormed the U.S. Capitol. I'll tell you why Donald Trump very obviously is to blame for this. And on top of that, we'll look at the double standard on display, how Black Lives Matter protesters were treated in 2020 compared to these far-right terrorists who literally staged a coup and invaded our capital. And of course, there was also a really important election this week. John Ossoff, and Raphael Warnock won and now Democrats will retake the Senate. I'm going to tell you what to expect from that, what the implications are, and um, we've got more than that, so stay tuned. Hopefully you all will enjoy the program. Let's get right to it. Um, yeah, this is going to be quite a lengthy episode, but I hope that you all are going to enjoy it. I'm still in shock after what happened yesterday when we saw far-right terrorists storm the United States Capitol and take it over. There's so much to talk about, so many angles to cover, and honestly, I, I'm still shocked by this, and I think that this really speaks to the poor shape that our country is in, because even if Donald Trump is on his way out in a couple of weeks, the fact that this many people were duped into believing this con man, that this election was stolen to the point where they would literally storm the Capitol in an attempt to do some sort of revolution or coup, whatever their intentions were, this is not healthy. Democracy can't survive if this continues. If we have a large portion of, of the population who doesn't even believe that our elections are free and fair. Now, if they were successful, which they wouldn't have been, but if they were successful and they were able to permanently stop the certification of the election results and somehow get Donald Trump to remain president, they think that they'd be the ones that are being patriotic and saving democracy, when in actuality, that's not the case. They're believing someone who is delusional. Now, 
we're going to talk through some things that really stood out to me that shows how dangerous this is. Like you can, you can point to the folks who were taking selfies and just kind of walking through sitting at Nancy Pelosi's desk, but this was very serious. So first of all, they found at least one IED on Capitol grounds. And second of all, one terrorist was seen with zip ties. Now this is important because it indicates that he was planning on taking hostages. Thank God he didn't but he was planning to do that. Now, also, at the RNC and DNC headquarters, which is just a couple of blocks away from the Capitol, things were taking place that are extremely disturbing, to say the least. So they found a pipe bomb at the RNC headquarters, and at the DNC headquarters, they also found a package that looked suspicious. Now, it hasn't been identified at the time of this recording, but we have to call this what it is. This is fascism. This is fascism instigated directly, incited directly by the President of the United States, and I want to share with you this compilation video that Mother Jones put together that really shows you how specifically Trump's words led to what happened at the U.S. Capitol. Take a look. And we fight. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Fuck 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 boys. Stand back and stand by. I am your president of law and order. As he spoke, a remarkable scene unfolded outside the White House. The members of our armed forces were moving forcefully. Fired at, gassed, and shoved. The president's uh, tweet, an extraordinary line, when the looting starts, the shooting starts. We will kill you! Please, but you also had people that were very fine people on both sides. This election will decide whether we will defend the American way of life or whether we will allow a radical movement to completely dismantle and destroy it. We're going to walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I love Pennsylvania Avenue. And we're going to the Capitol. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. So let's walk down Pennsylvania Avenue. I want to thank you all. God bless you and God bless America. Thank you all for being here. This is incredible. Thank you very much. Mr. President, stop inspiring people to commit potential acts of violence. Someone's going to get hurt. Someone's going to get shot. Someone's going to get killed. They brought out a woman on a stretcher, rushed her inside, blood gushing from her. Uh, we're told that she was shot in the chest. A short time ago, we learned that she has died. It's a very tough period of time. There's never been a time like this where such a thing happened, where they could take it away from all of us, from me, from you, from our country. This was a fraudulent election. So go home. We love you. You're very special. Now, Donald Trump is directly responsible, and I hope that there are consequences, but I doubt there will be any consequences. I think he is facing a temporary suspension from Twitter and Facebook, but you, you basically incited a seditious act. How is he not impeached again and jailed for something like this? This is literally traitor shit that we're seeing from the president. He encouraged all of this. And any Republican who was opposing the certification of the election results, anyone who basically pandered to Donald Trump and played his game all to appeal to Trump's base, they're also responsible. And it's why I fully support the effort by Representative Cory Bush to get any Republican who encouraged this expelled from Congress. Because here's the thing, we cannot have a government where a large portion of them are pandering to literal traitors who want to overthrow our democratic regime. We can't have that. We can't allow it. If you don't believe in democracy, you can't serve in Congress. And even if these Republicans like Josh Hawley and Ted Cruz don't even believe the lies that they're spewing and they're just pandering, it doesn't matter. What you're doing is seditious. This is sedition. You're traitors. Just like Donald Trump, you all have to go. You have to be expelled from Congress. So, this is deeply disturbing. There's really no amount of um, 
of me talking or commentary that I could that I can um, supply you with here that really does justice to just how outrageous the situation is. This this is going to be a problem, and I think that a lot of folks are under this impression that once Donald Trump is gone, everything is going to be okay. Things will get back to quote unquote normal, but that's not going to be the case. It's not like Donald Trump, you know, he convinced all of these people. Well, I shouldn't say that. He did convince them, at least when it comes to, you know, the election being stolen. But it's not like, you know, he is what made them crazy. They were already predisposed to be duped by a demagogue like Donald Trump because of the circumstances in this country. Had the circumstances in this country been better, we wouldn't have even gotten Donald Trump. But we had a demagogue come along and capitalized on the pain and suffering of people in this country. And if we don't take care of that, people will still be susceptible to radicalization. And things like this will happen. There could be another demagogue that comes along that isn't as idiotic as Donald Trump, who actually can pull off a coup. So we're in serious trouble as a country. I hate to say that, but we really are. We are in serious trouble. When you have far-right terrorists successfully storming the U.S. Capitol, and Capitol Police arguably letting them in. I mean, I don't know how else to explain explain it. Either they let them in or they failed. You know, you, you can see different videos that point to different things, but we're in serious trouble. And if we don't fix this problem, then I don't know how American democracy can survive. I don't know how America itself can survive. If this many fucking people are batshit insane. Conservatives in America, they don't just believe in small government and gun rights anymore. They're fucking insane. They are lunatics. You can't work with these people. You can't even have a policy debate with them because they don't even buy into reality anymore. So how do you go forward as a country with these folks? We're going to have to come to grips with this because the Trump era is coming to an end but Trumpism and what he represents and the delusion that is widespread in this country, that's not going to go away anytime soon. When far-right terrorists and traitors stormed the U.S. Capitol and took it over for a short period of time, it really showed to you how much the police are allowing right-wingers to get away with. Like, they were basically allowed to take selfies in the Senate, you know, just hang out, chill in the offices of various members of Congress, including Nancy Pelosi, and they all got to go home. Imagine that. Imagine being able to storm the Capitol, literally stage a coup, and then still be home in time for dinner. Could you imagine what would happen if Black Lives Matter tried to do this? Could you imagine what would happen? They would be lucky if they landed in jail, because that means that they would have survived, because they all would have been shot, because we know that police in America treat Black Lives Matter activists and black people, and even left-wing causes, entirely different than they treat right-wingers. So, in case you forgot, this is how Black Lives Matter activists were treated back in 2020. After the murder of George Floyd, when protests erupted across the country, this is how the cops treated them. What the hell? Here, police officers starting to move some of the crowd out. Or it looks like uh, something there is a confrontation. Come to the shot. Maybe Come to the shot. Is that a looks taser? Like a taser. Yeah, it looks like a taser. You see police officers physically assaulting Black Lives Matter protesters. But you might think, well, you know what? That's just like in various cities. This is the capital. So capital police are different, right? They're going to be more lenient. Well, no, in actuality, if any police in the country is going to be a lot more stringent in the way that they deal with protests, you'd think that the capital would be the area where they take protests more seriously because this is our capital. They have to protect the capital, right? 
Uh, so if you'll recall back in 2017, I think it was, when uh, the Republican Party was proposing their repeal of the Affordable Care Act and they were proposing cuts to Medicaid, there were dozens of disabled activists that protested outside of Mitch McConnell's office. And can you guess what happened? Capitol Police did not clear a path for them to go through. Capitol Police didn't allow them to make their voices heard. Capitol Police arrested them. Some of them were literally dragged out off of their wheelchairs. Take a look. absolutely just stunning. You know, if those protesters wanted to stay and make their voices heard and remain outside of Mitch McConnell's office, now we know that all they needed to do was put on a MAGA hat and then they would have been allowed to stay by Capitol Police. Where was, um, where was this energy when they stormed the Capitol? Where was that energy? It's shocking. And a lot of folks who protested at the Capitol explain that Capitol Police... They don't take any shit. Adi Barkin tweeted out, I was arrested by Capitol Police for sitting peacefully eight times. These rioters get escorted out to freedom. Alexis Goldstein writes, when protesters tried to take the Capitol steps during the Kavanaugh nomination, every single person was arrested. But yet, these folks got to go home. Trump and Republicans called on them to go home, and that was it. You have folks literally looting the Capitol building. I thought that the party of law and order was against rioters and looters. And they just get to go home. No jail time. Nothing. Where was this restraint during the Black Lives Matter protests? This is how right-wingers are allowed to act. Remember when armed thugs stormed the Capitol building in Michigan to protest the lockdown orders due to COVID-19? I mean, look at the restraint that police officers exercised as armed thugs screamed in their faces and what we saw from the riots at the capitol i mean they were they were no different there were clashes with pro-trump terrorists and you know some were tear gassed but for the most part the individuals who literally tried to stage a coup of our government were not met with the ruthlessness that we saw during the black lives matter protests in fact capitol police literally stood by as they watched far-right terrorists invade the Capitol building. Can you imagine how they would act if Black Lives Matter protesters would be doing that? I'd imagine they wouldn't be standing idly by. Now, if you're wondering why are they letting them just do that? Why are they standing there? Why aren't they doing anything? Well, this video from TikTok shows that they opened the gates for them. They welcomed them in. Police are squabbling with protesters. Oh, there we go. And it gets worse because one Capitol Police officer even took a selfie with one of these terrorists. So you invade the Capitol building and Capitol Police, rather than dragging you out as they did disabled protesters and peaceful protesters prior, they take selfies with you. Are they arrested? Are they uh, brutalized like Black Lives Matter protesters would be? Like, I'm not calling for them to be brutalized, right? Peaceful protesters, I don't care if you're right wing or left wing, you should not be brutalized. That's not what I'm advocating. But what I'm saying here is we have to acknowledge the double standard. How often do we see peaceful protesters advocating for good causes arrested when leaving the Capitol building? But when you have a literal coup attempt, well... They don't arrest you. They let you leave. And sometimes they might hold your hand and help you out quite literally, as we see from this video that was shared by Alexis Goldstein, literally being escorted out as she takes her time and he's helping her. This is someone who just was part of a coup attempt. And you see a Capitol Police officer in riot gear 
helping her. So the question is, why were Capitol Police showing so much restraint? Why were they behaving in a way uh, that's relatively respectful when Black Lives Matter protesters, they get beat up, they get maced, pepper sprayed, uh, brutalized. Why were Capitol Police allowing this to happen? Uh, well, as the New York Times reports, Inside the Capitol, an officer pleaded with a man in a green backpack saying, you guys just need to go outside. When asked why they weren't expelling the protesters, the officer said, we've just got to let them do their thing now. That is amazing. So if you're a right winger, you could do anything. You could literally storm the U.S. Capitol and stage a coup and you could just leave. They'll help you out. That is insane to me. When we just watched the video of Black Lives Matter protesters being sprayed from behind, getting pushed and kicked, but try to stage a coup, take over our government and our democratic regime, and we just got to let them do their thing. They're just mad guys. And it's not just the Capitol Police who I'm furious at right now. It's public officials. Uh, Ivanka Trump, before deleting this tweet, literally addressed them by calling them American patriots. And when Trump tweeted out a video where he addressed them, of course, he was kissing their asses too. I know your pain. I know you're hurt. We love you. You're very special. Now, contrast what he said there with the way he spoke about the protesters after George Floyd was murdered. Quote, these thugs are dishonoring the memory of George Floyd, and I won't let that happen. Just spoke to Governor Tim Walls and told him that the military is with him all the way. Any difficulty, and we will assume control. But when the looting starts, the shooting starts. Thank you. Now, in his message to fascists, he didn't threaten to bring in the military or forcefully remove them. He asked them politely to go home. And if you're wondering why we have this double standard... Well, I think that's pretty obvious. We live in a white supremacist country where white outrage is always justified under every single circumstance, but black outrage is never justified. You're protesting and rioting over the death of a black American at the hands of the state, completely unjustified. But if you're wanting to steal democracy away because you believe some idiotic reality television show star that this election was rigged, well, that's fine, because you're white. Your anger is justified. Your intentions are pure. But outrage over black deaths? Never justifiable. You should stop looting and rioting. There's no amount of pain that would justify that kind of behavior. It's just astonishing. Like, this double standard should piss every single person off. And, you know, the reason why we have this double standard is because in a lot of instances, I'm generalizing, but in a lot of instances, if you ask a cop, Nine times out of ten, they're going to say they're a Republican or a Trump supporter. Not all of them, but the overwhelming majority of them. And that's a really big problem. The fact that law enforcement in America is uh, right-wing, and we have a right-wing party who is authoritarian, that is a really big problem. Now, Capitol Police, you know, it's not like they're not capable of getting this crowd under control. Because if you'll remember, last summer, they used chemical weapons against peaceful protesters. I don't know if that was Capitol Police and National Guard. I don't know what the case was. But they used chemical weapons, tear gas against peaceful protesters, and they did this all so Donald Trump could take a photo op. So make no mistake about it, the only reason why this happened is because Capitol Police let it happen. A privilege that would never, ever be afforded to Black Lives Matter protesters. Black people would never be allowed to behave this way at our nation's capital. And as journalist Garrett Graff puts it, I can't get over how thoroughly the Capitol Police, one of the nation's largest and best-funded police forces, failed today. Their utter abdication of their most basic role, hold control and secure the Capitol building, endangered every person inside, from the vice president down. To be clear, this was a total strategic failure by Capitol Police, not a tactical one. This wasn't like a couple protesters slipped in a side door that was accidentally unlocked. Rioters stormed up the main Capitol steps and waltzed in, and then, just as appallingly, waltzed out. Now, Bill Kibben responded to this, saying, having been routinely arrested by them at a completely peaceful, utterly non-threatening pre-announced protest with a 93-year-old woman, I can testify that they're capable of acting like jerks when they want to. So, in other words, it happened because... They let it happen. So this is extremely like demoralizing and depressing to see. Uh, I just don't know how, as a country, we move forward. You can't work with a party and a base that is completely delusional and violent. 
being delusional in and of itself is an issue. But being violent and delusional, that is a very dangerous, very dangerous combination. And that's what we saw take place. And it's not going to go away with Donald Trump. I'm worried that this is going to take place at state capitals across the country, um, at the inauguration. And, uh, you know, the FBI has been warning about far-right violence for years now, but it's been swept under the rug. Uh, so maybe it's time that they actually pay attention because lawmakers were in danger today. Lawmakers were in danger. So if they don't take this seriously and start paying attention to far-right violence in this country and far-right terrorism, when will they? Believe it or not, the Georgia runoff race took place on Tuesday, but now after everything that's happened, after extremists stormed the U.S. Capitol, it seems like it was so far away, but that happened this week. And on Tuesday evening, I was contemplating making a video and releasing it, and I really wish that I did. Dave Wasserman had called the race. It had been called for uh, Raphael Warnock, but John Ossoff, it wasn't called for him yet, and we were trying to determine whether or not he'd win by a large enough margin to not trigger a recount. And so I just thought... If I make a video, I'm going to want to go into depth about what the implications of this are, because if both of them win, then Dems retake the Senate. And if it's not actually official, if Ossoff doesn't win, then that entire conversation will be moot. So I decided to wait. And then the following day, uh, we had far-right extremists storm the Capitol, and I didn't get to talk about this when I wanted to. But I think this is something that needs to be addressed. It's really, really significant. Democrats will retake the Senate. Bernie Sanders will become the budget committee chairman. And we have a chance of getting Nina Turner elected to Congress. This is really good. And what we're seeing is a promise from Joe Biden and both John Ossoff and Raphael Warnock that $2,000 stimulus checks are coming. So there's actually a little bit of cause for optimism to be a little bit hopeful in the short term. Long term, we've got a lot of work to do. But I think that this is so, so important Primarily because uh, of one thing, Mitch McConnell will no longer be Senate Majority Leader. That, to me, is really what this is all about. Mitch McConnell has been an obstacle to anything getting done. Incrementalism, just basic governmental functioning. He has blocked everything. Like, the damage that he has caused, the legacy is going to live on for decades. So just to have him not be Senate Majority Leader, I care about that more than anything. Uh, but having said that, though, it is now the case that Democrats are in complete control of government, and Kamala Harris will be the tiebreaker. So that means they could do whatever they want to do now. And I have a suspicion uh, that some Democrats aren't too happy about this. Not all of them. I think a lot of them are genuinely happy, and I'm talking about elected Democrats. But now they've got to put up you can't blame anyone. You can't blame Donald Trump. You can't blame Mitch McConnell. If we're going to hold anyone in government accountable, we know which party is in power. It is the Democratic Party. So now there's no excuses. We're in the middle of a pandemic and expectations are very high. If Democrats fuck this up, they will lose control of the House in 2022. Now, it is usually the case that the party in control does lose control of, uh, you know, the House or the Senate, one branch of government, after the first election when they're in power. And so if they want to stop that from happening and actually really make some changes, there's a lot that I think they need to do. Of course, there's the usual policies that I'm always going to advocate for, Medicare for all. And I fully, fully expect progressive members of Congress to go to bat for that policy. Like, don't allow them to just push for access to health care and accept that that's their position. No, you don't you don't negotiate on their terms. You force them. You get rowdy. You make sure that you get what you want. But I'm just going to say that Democrats, the first few things that they have got to prioritize is they have to save democracy. And what I mean by that is you have to get electoral reform. And this doesn't have to be substantial. But we need a new Voting Rights Act. We need to make sure that voting is a national holiday, so that way turnout is higher. And you have to make sure that D.C. and Puerto Rico become states. If Democrats do that, if they strengthen democracy, just that one act can give them the edge in the following election when it's expected that they could lose even more ground. Because if you have 
D.C. and Puerto Rico as states, then that is uh, two more senators from each state that will most likely be Democratic. And people will respond by saying, Mike, this is like really dirty because you're, you're trying to like change the institution to benefit, you know, the party who you hate the least. But that's not actually the case because anytime we're literally strengthening democracy by expanding voting universally and franchising people, making sure that more people have adequate representation in D.C. and Puerto Rico, that's a good thing for democracy. And so if that hurts Republicans, it makes it more difficult for them to win. They've got to convince those folks. They've got to stop being so fucking in extreme and loony and actually offer people something, anything. And then once Democrats do that, then they need to look seriously at reforming the Supreme Court. I want them to pack the court. I think that after Republicans stole two seats from you, it's completely reasonable for you to appoint two Supreme Court justices yourselves. Like, there's nothing in the Constitution that limits the amount of judges that we have. It's just a norm that there's supposed to be nine Supreme Court justices. Expand the court or do some sort of uh, reform. Kill the filibuster. If they don't take these actions to actually reform these institutions, then we're going to be right back to square one where Republicans can just run roughshod over them. And, uh, you know, the country suffers and becomes more radicalized. And um, that's a result of, you know, them being deprived of material goods. Uh, now, if they are able to do all of this, I think that that bodes well for the, uh, the functioning of democracy. And I say that because if Democrats strengthen democracy and they make it more difficult for Republicans to win, since they can only win when they suppress turnout and whatnot, they're going to have no choice. Republicans will have to moderate at least a little bit. This party has been going further and further and further and further to the right. And what we just saw over the last couple of years was them slam into a brick wall. You can only move so far to the right until you reach full-blown authoritarianism. And we saw that. So if it becomes more difficult for Republicans to win, legitimately so, because our democracy has been strengthened and suffrage has been expanded... They're going to have no choice. They have to moderate. They can still try to suppress the votes and implement voter ID laws and, you know, try to crush the Postal Service, but they're going to have to moderate at least a little bit. The extremism will have to be toned down, and I think overall that's a really good thing. Now, I'm talking about reforms, but when it comes to policies, we better see some damn good policies, and, you know, my expectations are higher than they usually are because... The Senate Majority Leader now is Chuck Schumer. And guess what? He's got a primary coming up in 2022. So all eyes are on Chuck Schumer. If we don't get the goods, you go. You go bye-bye. <laughs> so you better fucking put up or shut up. And it looks like he knows that the task ahead of him is absolutely momentous. So he's been pushing for a cancellation of $50,000 of student debt. That's, that's great. Do it. Let's cancel it all. I hope that the left in Congress pushes for that. But deliver. Look, Democrats, if they don't deliver, if they don't do some major reforms, governmental reforms and policy reforms that stops people from suffering, we're going to be right back to square one. And when we get to a position where people feel depressed because government isn't responding to their needs and Republicans take over again, we're going to look back to these next two years and say it's because Democrats didn't do enough. So if they want to stop that from happening, they've got to deliver because, again, no excuses. And that means... We've got to be mobilized. We've got to be ready to dedicate like time every single day to call the phones of members of Congress. Take action. I mean, you can't do much during a pandemic. I'm not going to encourage people to, you know, protest in person when we see record numbers with hospitals being overrun. But when the pandemic actually is under control, um, that's when we can actually do more direct action. But for now, the most that I'll encourage is for you to do public pressure you know, to everyone in Congress, make sure that the left is holding the conservative Democrats accountable. Uh, you know, we're expecting a lot. And I really am hoping to see, you know, progressives challenge Democratic Party leadership, challenge them and not just accept their position as the valid and legitimate one. Like if we talk about healthcare reform, don't just accept that a public option is the best that we can get. Actually fight for Medicare for all. Use Hardcore bargaining tactics. I don't care. You know, when AOC showed up to her first day in Congress, 
she sat in Nancy Pelosi's office. Maybe we've got to do that again. Like, get hardcore, because if you don't hold them accountable, we're going to hold you accountable. We're watching. All eyes are on Democrats right now. So this is going to be really interesting, and I actually do feel enthusiastic about what's to come, even though I uh, feel dread looming as well, because I am fully expecting Democrats to disappoint me, but the expectations are very, very high. Uh, I know Democrats are going to um, fuck up and get cold feet, and Joe Biden just isn't the right person for this moment, but that doesn't mean we're not going to push them as hard as we possibly can. Moving Joe Biden left is not going to be an easy thing to do, and I think it's probably not possible to get him to uh, to move left on a lot of issues, but we make progress where we can, and we absolutely push the envelope on every single issue. If Democrats offer you one thing, you always counter offer and get as much as you possibly can, and if politicians, the squad, leftists in Congress don't do enough, then that's on us. We've got to take accountability responsibility too if we don't hold them accountable. So I'll leave that there. There's a there's a lot, and I'm I'm really interested to see um, what happens in the next uh, couple of years. But first, Democrats got to come out the gate swinging and get reforms implemented, uh, change government, expand dem expand democracy, strengthen our institutions. Otherwise, we're going to be right back to square one again, where we have another demagogue, you know, exploiting people's desperation due to radicalization. And, you know, this time, the only folks who will be to blame are Democrats. So, good luck. It is really astonishing to me to watch Republicans who incited the very insurrection that took place at the Capitol all of a sudden feign outrage at the sight of violence. People like Ted Cruz, Josh Hawley, you don't get to condemn violence now after you started all of this. You directly incited an insurrection. You told Donald Trump's cultist, delusional base that the election was stolen from them. So you worked them into a frenzy. You made them believe that the right course of action, of course, to save democracy is to storm the Capitol and to stop Joe Biden, an illegitimate president, from being sworn in. You did all of this. You incited the violence that you're now denouncing. So now it's funny to watch them, you know, sit there with their surprised Pikachu faces as if they didn't start this. Ted Cruz put out this statement. The attack at the Capitol was a despicable act of terrorism and a shocking assault on our democratic system. We must come together and put this anger and division behind us. We must, and I am confident we will, have a peaceful and orderly transition of power. My full statement, which we're not going to read. But it's funny, you're calling for an orderly and peaceful transition of power that already has failed. We're not seeing an orderly and peaceful transition of power. We're seeing violence because you told delusional people that the election was stolen from them. In fact, in the Senate, you were leading the charge, Ted. You were leading the charge. So you don't get to try to save face now and pretend as if you weren't responsible. The four individuals who were killed storming the Capitol, their blood is on your hands. But no, he condemns violence, and what they did was terrorism, that he's not responsible for inciting in any way, shape, or form. Let me ask you this, Ted. If you condemn the violence that we saw, uh, why did you say this a couple of days prior? Stand shoulder to shoulder with you as we defend the United States of America, as we defend our Constitution, as we defend our freedom, and we will not go quietly into the night. We will defend liberty in the future and we are going to win that you is that you saying we will not go silently into the night like it's just shocking to me like they say this as if nobody's going to call them out on their bullshit ted cruz knows exactly what he's doing i do think that there are republicans elected republicans who believe the election was stolen from donald trump because a lot of them are as idiotic as donald trump albeit Probably not as delusional, not as bad, but Ted Cruz is smart enough to know what he's doing. This is an educated man. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows that if he doesn't pander to Donald Trump's base, then it's going to be very difficult for him to become president one day. So if you have political ambitions, if you're Josh Hawley or Ted Cruz, you know in order to win a Republican Party primary, you have to capture Donald Trump's base. This is what you're doing. And you thought that sacrificing democracy, threatening democracy... By pandering to delusional people, a cult is worthwhile, all for your political ambitions. Well, I say to hell with that, and there has to be consequences for the actions of Republicans 
who incited a literal insurrection. This was a coup attempt, and it was a failed one, it was a laughable one, but nonetheless, it's still a serious attack on our democracy. What Ted Cruz did by playing along to Donald Trump, he was knowingly complicit in inciting an insurrection, and thankfully, individuals within the squad are calling them out and calling for accountability. So AOC tweeted out, Senator Cruz, you must accept responsibility for how your craven, self-serving actions contributed to the deaths of four people yesterday and how you fundraised off this riot. Both you and Senator Hawley must resign. If you do not, the Senate should move for your expulsion. He then responded to her from the account that I believe he liked porn on, uh, and he tried to change the subject, basically saying, AOC, you are a liar. Leading a debate in the Senate on ensuring election integrity is doing our jobs, and it's in no way responsible, this is bullshit, for the despicable terrorists who attacked the Capitol yesterday. And sorry, I ain't going anywhere when you and your socialist buddies try to massively raise taxes, when you try to pass the Green New Deal and destroy millions of jobs, when you push for amnesty, when you try to pack the Supreme Court with activists to undermine our our constitutional rights, I will fight that every step and stand with the people. What a fucking lying scumbag. What a lying scumbag. Packing the Supreme Court is exactly what the Republican Party has done over the last couple of years. You stole two Supreme Court justices, so I'm not even going to answer to that, like respond to what he's saying because he's trying to deflect. He's trying to change the subject. And his answer in pandering to Donald Trump, trying to make them, uh, his supporters believe that the election was stolen, his response is, oh, well, you know, I'm just looking out for election integrity. Look, if you're an election integrity activist, Ted Cruz, which we know you're not, then what you push for is automatic uh, recounts if votes are within a certain margin, automatic audits at the county level. If you're an election integrity activist, you push for universal suffrage. But what you did, that wasn't you looking out for the integrity of our democracy and elections. What you did was knowingly lie about the election being stolen in a pathetic attempt to pander to Donald Trump's sycophantic base. You're a traitor, and you just encouraged seditious behavior, and we're not going to forget this. But it's not just Ted Cruz. So I don't want to only focus on Ted Cruz, even though he was kind of the ringleader in the Senate because he really wants to prove to Trump's base that he should be the heir to Trump's throne. But it's also individuals like Josh Hawley and also more than 100 Republicans who were elected to the House of Representatives. And the New York Times actually posted all of their faces. These 147 Republicans who were elected came out against democracy. And this was after a group of far-right insurrectionists violently staged a coup. Look at their faces. Soak this in. Do any of these scumbags represent you? Because if so, they need to be out. And in spite of their pseudo-patriotism and flag-humping, these Republicans are traitors. They're not patriots. They are seditious traitors who rejected American democracy. And there needs to be consequences for their actions. This is the effort they supported. Terrorists openly agitating for a civil war, wearing merch, broadcasting their intent to start a civil war, which would kill thousands of Americans, if not millions. And these are traitors who brought a racist Confederate flag into the Capitol. These are literal Nazis wearing Camp Auschwitz shirts and 6M WE shirts, which means 6 million Jews wasn't enough. These are the people who these Republicans emboldened and supported. And it turns out, in addition to the pipe bombs that were found, uh, along with the man who had zip ties, presumably because he wanted to take hostages, one person actually showed up with 11 Molotov cocktails that were ready to go, according to the Justice Department. This is who those 147 Republicans supported and emboldened yesterday. After everything that they saw yesterday, those Republicans still chose to oppose the certification of a free and fair election. They incited this behavior. Let's, let's be very clear about that. They incited this. Because when you tell folks that democracy is in trouble and an election was stolen, delusional people are going to respond accordingly. They're going to believe you. You have influence. You're persuasive to the Republican base. So when you tell them democracy was stolen from you, they're going to respond in a way that they believe is proportional. They're going to storm the Capitol and try to save democracy. You did this. And after they saw all of this take place, all of their lives were endangered by extremists. They still chose to go along with this scam, pretend as if the election was stolen. It's just... It's shocking. So there has to be consequences. They have to be held accountable, which is why I fully support the effort by Cori Bush to get them expelled from Congress. Because if you don't support democracy, then you have no business serving in a democratic body. There's lots of people who would love to take your spot and actually fight 
for your constituents. So Cori Bush tweeted this out. I believe the Republican members of Congress who have incited this domestic terror attack through their attempts to overturn the election must face consequences. They have broken their sacred oath of office. I will be introducing a resolution calling for their expulsion. Now, in an interview with the press, she explained why this is necessary. And I think the obvious thing that you do. The fact that someone lost their life today, that blood is on Donald Trump's hands and every Republican Congress person that is supporting this. People came into this Capitol building, broke through, broke uh, windows and all of that, came in, went into Congress members' offices, all in an attempt to attack our democracy. That life, that woman's life, no matter who she was, no matter what side she was on, her life is gone. There has to be consequences. And so that's why we introduced a resolution to say so. Those Republican members of Congress must go. And she is 100% right, and I'm glad that she is holding them accountable. The reason why the Republican Party has shifted so far to the right is because there's been no check on them. Whenever they shift to the right, the Democratic Party, at the aggregate level, it shifts to the right as well. It follows them to the right. And some imbeciles like Chris Coons and Joe Manchin are saying, well, after we saw far-right extremists storm the Capitol, now is the time to really take them seriously. Now is the time for bipartisanship. This party has proven to you time and again that they don't care about bipartisanship. They've proven to you that they don't even care about democracy. I mean, the Republican Party has always rejected democracy with voter suppression efforts and whatnot. But now they couldn't be more brazen. Now is the time when you marginalize them and you get them expelled from Congress because this is what they instigated. Had it not been for their lies about the election being stolen, this wouldn't have been uh, this wouldn't have happened. So they've got to be expelled. Uh, and I'm glad that individuals like AOC, Mondaire Jones, Marie Newman, Cori Bush are standing up. And I'm actually encouraged to see individuals like Chuck Schumer and Nancy Pelosi, of all people who we've had to fight to hold Trump accountable, call on Mike Pence to invoke the 25th Amendment. Now, I don't think that that's actually going to bear out. I hope it does. There's reports that they were uh, Trump's cabinet was meeting to talk about this. But I think an easier solution, if you want to remove him quickly, would be impeachment. But, I mean, he's going to be gone in a few weeks. So uh, all of this could be for nothing. But still, even if Trump is out and he's not impeached or we don't invoke the 25th Amendment, there's still more than 100 Republicans, 147 to be exact, that are traitors, that absolutely are responsible for fomenting an insurrection and they have to be held accountable. They have to be expelled from Congress because if they don't, then this is going to happen again and the party is going to continue to shift to the right and the base will become more and more extreme as a result. I feel like as soon as some of us saw a pro-Trump mob storm the Capitol, we already kind of expected what the right wing would say because they have to maintain this facade that it's only the left who riots and gets violent. It's never right-wingers. In fact, you can go back and see a lot of tweets from Charlie Kirk and Tommy Loren where they talk about how, you know, if Trump supporters uh, see that Donald Trump lost this election, they're just going to resume their daily life. They're not going to riot as, you know, the radical left does. But of course, right-wingers, they, uh, they, they rioted. Not only that, they literally tried to stage a coup. They committed an act of insurrection. And these are the folks who are supposed to be patriotic. Uh, nonetheless, I, I think it's obvious. Like, if you're a reasonable human being who you blame for this, you blame the individuals like Donald Trump, Ted Cruz, who used the incendiary language that got people to believe that the election was stolen. So the only way to save democracy was to storm the Capitol. You blame those folks. Uh, but if you're a disingenuous hack, uh, you want to know who you blame? You blame Antifa, because of course you do. We all knew this was coming. We knew that they would, uh, you know, say this was maybe a false flag or imply that this wasn't actually Trump supporters because Trump supporters would never do something like this. Take a look at an elected member of Congress, Matt Gates from Florida, say that there is compelling evidence that it was Antifa who was part of this crowd who stormed the Capitol at the behest of Donald Trump. 
some pretty compelling evidence from a facial recognition company showing that some of the people who breached the Capitol today were not Trump supporters. They were masquerading as Trump supporters and, in fact, were members of the violent terrorist group Antifa. Now, we should seek to build America up, not tear her down and destroy her. And I am sure glad that at least for one day, I didn't hear my Democrat colleagues calling to defund the police. I can't imagine what it's like to be that fucking stupid. How many times a day does he almost die from forgetting to breathe? How many times in his life has he tied his own shoelaces together? I mean, this is fucking pants on head. Stupid. There's compelling evidence that some of the people were not Trump supporters. They were masquerading around as Trump supporters. And the evidence from this is one facial recognition company. Um, except, hey, dumbass, none of the people there were wearing masks. And Antifa always wears masks. Like, I heard, I think it was Ethan Klein of H3 make this point, and it's a really great point, um, that, you know, of all the times for Trump supporters to... Uh, not want to wear masks you'd think that when they storm the capitol and commit felonies that would be the one time maybe they make an exception uh but no they still refuse to wear masks because that to them represents tyranny but in what universe is it reasonable to think that antifa was part of this crowd like i don't i don't really know like does he think that like 10 percent of them were antifa and they were just there to kind of like antagonize and rile everyone up all you have to do is look to the social media accounts look at parlor as much as that will rot your brain, but there are screenshots of posts where they've been planning this now for a week or so. They actually have merch that says American Civil War, January 6th. They were planning this, and so you think this is Antifa? Like, there's no way he believes this. He's just saying that because that's what you do. You know, if you're unsure who to blame in any situation, it doesn't matter what the facts bear out. It doesn't matter what the, you know, uh, the context and conditions are. You just blame Antifa. That's what you do. You, it's that meme, you know, you throw a stick in uh, the wheel of your bike and then you fall over and then you blame Antifa for it. it. It's just, it's fucking incredible. Like, this is a member of Congress and he is that stupid. And he, if he's not stupid, uh, then he's disingenuous. I don't know what it is. It's either dumb or disingenuity, but it's a distinction without a difference. For him to say this on the House floor is, is shocking. And he then goes on to like own the libs by saying, oh, well, I'm really glad that my colleagues now don't want to defund the police. Ho, ho, ho. As if like the entire Democratic Party is talking about defunding the police. There's like, what, five people, members of the squad who support defunding the police explicitly. And you say this as if that's an own when we saw Capitol Police basically open the gates for Trump supporters to storm the Capitol. I mean, look at this tweet. This says it all. Uh, you telling me this tactical genius overpowered the officers protecting the Capitol? Exactly. So uh, if ever there was a time to defund the police, it's when we learned that they're complicit with an insurrection, when they take selfies with terrorists, when they open the gates and allow them to storm the Capitol, the very building that they are paid to protect. Yeah, I'd say defending the police is a pretty damn good idea. It's just, I don't, I don't, I don't know what to say. Like, I'm at a loss for words. The Republican Party is so idiotic. Like, we have the Democratic Party, which needs so many reforms to even be remotely representative of its constituents. But you have the Republican Party, who's just out of this world. Like, they're in a parallel universe, out of this dimension, off their fucking rockers. They are insane. And I don't know how any conservative can support this party any longer like this is no longer the party of you know uh less taxes which they were never about that they were about less taxes for corporations but this isn't the party of like gun rights and uh, abortion rights this is a party that denies objective empirical reality they're delusional so how can you support this how do you not sign up to be a libertarian or independent? How can you support this party? The fact that so many Americans support this party, even if they're still a minority party, it's too many. Like one American is too many to support the Republican Party. They're just they're insane. I don't know how else to put it. They're insane. And anyone who doesn't see that must be insane as well. So, uh, yeah, Matt Gates blaming Antifa for the pro-Trump insurrection because we all know how much Antifa loves Donald Trump. I'm, I'm sure that the implication was... Uh, they're trying to make Donald Trump supporters look bad as if they don't do that on their own. But he's he's blaming Antifa because, uh, you know, when all else fails, you blame Antifa. That's the most persuasive line to these idiots. 
Donald Trump has never officially and formally conceded the election to Joe Biden, and he will never officially formally concede to Joe Biden. But I think this is as close as we're going to get this statement put out by White House Deputy Chief of Staff Dan Scavino, where Trump told him this after the electoral certification. Quote, even though I totally disagree with the outcome of the election and the facts bear me out, no, they don't. Nevertheless, there will be an orderly transition on January 20th. I've always said we will continue our fight to ensure that only legal votes were counted, while this represents the end of the greatest first term in presidential history delusional. It's only the beginning of our fight to make America great again. Wow. So reasonable. So reasonable. <sighs> now he's saying there's going to be an orderly transition on January 20th, meaning I'm not going to flip over the desk in the Oval Office and like push it against the door and force them to drag me out in handcuffs. I'm just going to go willingly. That's basically what the statement says. What a fucking clown Donald Trump is. What a clown. And he is incapable of telling the truth. Because I think he literally believes his own delusion now. He believes this election was stolen from him. Because cognitive dissonance is so severe that he just refuses to accept that the American people rejected him. Because he sucked his own cock off in this statement saying, um, this represents the end of the greatest first term in presidential history. Hundreds of thousands of Americans have died under your watch because you did fuck all for them during a global pandemic, you goddamn imbecile. And we finally have the vaccine you've been boasting about for months. And what have you done? Fumbled with the rollout. How many people have been vaccinated? Compare us to other countries per capita. And you'll see the rollout has been a disaster. So it's just, this is someone who is so beyond the pale, so delusional that anyone who supports him should be ashamed of themselves. And they're not going to see it now because they're still within that cult. But as time goes on, I am confident that Trump supporters will look back and be embarrassed. Actually, I'm not confident as they say those words. They still like Reagan. But I mean, even Trump. He's worse than Reagan. So this st stupidity here that's on display, like, it, it, here's what I'll say. If you don't look back and see what a buffoon Donald Trump was, then it just, it just speaks to you, your character, your intelligence, your naivete. It speaks to you as a flawed human being. And we're all flawed. But to actually buy into the lies of this fucking, not just con man, but idiot. I mean, he's a bumbling buffoon. To believe him to be in this cult... It's just embarrassing. It's not just embarrassing for you and your family and your friends. It's embarrassing for all of us as Americans. Like, to believe someone this stupid. Like, there have been, you know, cultist personalities in politics in the past, but none of them have been as idiotic and bombastic and narcissistic and megalomaniacal as Donald Trump. I mean, you think that if there was ever going to be a demagogue that dupes millions of people in America, it would be someone who at least isn't as dumb as Donald Trump, but we have this mouth-breathing reality television show star who's a complete idiot, and this is the individual who tried to kill democracy, who got the closest we've ever gotten to undoing our democratic institutions and instituting authoritarianism. Like, he pushed our institutions all the way to the limit, to their breaking point, and somehow democracy prevailed so far, but I mean, like, he puts out this statement as if we should give him credit. Oh, well, I'm going to leave and I'm not going to force Capitol Police to escort me out in handcuffs. Wow. Grown up. You've grown up. Really proud of you. What a big man you are. Unbelievable. Like, I'm just astounded. I'm astounded by all of this. It will never, ever not be crazy to me to think that Donald Trump was president even after he's gone. It's still shocking that this imbecile made it to the White House. And it shows you what poor of a state we are in as a country to allow this to happen. If this idiot can exploit the economic anxiety and racism to the extent that he did and get away with it, then we've got a lot of work to do. We've got a lot of work to do as a country. So I'll leave that there because at this point, I think I'm just ranting and raving and it's not going to be helpful to anyone. But it's just I I'm <laughs> I'm continually shocked by Donald Trump whenever I, I feel like I'm getting desensitized to his shenanigans and antics. He somehow manages to, um, you know, subvert all of my expectations. And I I'm just left again with my mouth open. Uh wondering how this is real, how we're not in some weird simulation 
that uh, has gone wrong. It's just shocking. So there we have it, guys. Uh, Donald Trump has officially conceded the election, at least as close as will come to a formal concession. And uh, it's not even a real concession, but this is as good as it gets when you are an idiot like Donald Trump. Wow. Donald Trump will be out of office soon, um, but when he's out, there's still going to be millions of people, millions of Trump supporters, millions of people within this cult, and they're not going to go away. They either need to be brought back to reality or some other demagogue who may be even more effective politically than Donald Trump will come along and capitalize on their ignorance and stupidity. And as a country, we have to grapple with this. We have to grapple with the fact that there's a large portion of American society that just rejects empirical reality. How do we go forward as a country? It's a real question. It's an issue that we're all going to have to deal with. So I've got a series of videos here, uh, one from Status Quo, a couple from uh, CNN, where reporters will talk to Trump supporters and the things that they say, it's downright delusional. Like this is cult-like, it's sycophantic, but it's just more so than anything else. It makes you really feel just disturbed and hopeless at the situation. So this one is from uh, John Farina of Status Quo. He talks to Trump supporters and what we see here, I haven't seen all of this. Just watch. And can you tell me about the uh, the steal? The, uh, why you're here to stop the steal? Because they already proved in Pennsylvania that over 200,000 votes, more than how many people voted in the state of Pennsylvania, not include all the rest of the illegal votes that happened in all the other states. Yeah, I don't feel we're being represented. We've got 80 million people now, probably more like 90 million people that are pissed off about the election. And everybody, you know it, they all know it's been stolen. Yeah, not fooling us. Joe Biden's a farce. Uh, uh, can you tell me uh, a little bit about the, uh, the election and the steal and how it was stolen? I uh, Dominion voting machines, uh, every, every which way but loose, every which way you guys possibly could. That's all he says. Dominion voting machines, and then he's got nothing. E every which way you could. That's not evidence. That isn't sufficient to prove the election was stolen. I just, these folks live in an alternate reality. The cognitive dissonance is, is so strong that they've just like bought into their own delusions. And like if Trump was like everything he said occurred in a vacuum and it only affected him, that'd be one thing. But the fact that his supporters believe his lies and stupidity, that's the real issue here. The folk, uh, the fact that these folks believe the election was stolen from Donald Trump is insane. It's insane. If the election was stolen, don't you think that Democrats would have, you know, uh, done a little bit more to uh, steal the House, not lose ground in the House, get a more comfortable margin in the Senate, don't you think that the Republicans from Georgia, such as Marjorie Taylor Greene, who won handily, would have lost their elections as well? Like, there's no consistency here. It's just convenient thinking because they don't want to believe that Daddy Trump could ever lose because, you know, he, he built this brand of I'm the ultimate deal maker. I'm a winner and you're never going to get tired of winning or whatever. It's just, you know, they, they can't they can't believe anything that contradicts their worldview, so they just choose to literally reject empirical reality. It's astonishing to me to watch this. They don't want any more can't, cowardly. I've, I've dumped women for less evidence of cheating. Like I'm sure they're better off now, dude. Because we believe in freedom, and we're on the verge of losing freedom. We had a duly elected president and trying to take that away from us. And I got a lot of friends back home just couldn't make it. And just want to let everybody know that we got to keep these freedoms that we have or we'll never get them back. We got to keep these freedoms that we have. This individual literally believes that democracy was stolen. And so the only way to unrig this election is to take Biden's win away. But to save democracy, what he doesn't understand is he... In his mind, it's saving democracy, but in actuality, you are the ones who are stealing democracy. You're stealing democracy away from the rightful winner. Joe Biden, love him or hate him, got 
almost, what was it, 10 million more votes than Donald Trump? And yet you still believe it was stolen? And see, that's the issue. It's that, like, these folks genuinely believe that they are doing the right thing. It's not them who's attacking democracy. It's anyone who doesn't buy into these lies. They're all part of it. They're co-conspirators. You know, they're complicit. This this is going to be an issue for a really long time. Like, the outright delusional behavior of the Republican Party base will continue to be a problem so long as the Republican Party elected Republicans uh, make them believe this stuff. You know, uh, I think there's a lot of Republicans in Congress who are stupid and believe this bullshit, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, Louis Gomer. There, there's a bunch of them. But a lot of them know exactly what they're doing, and they know that they're working these folks into a frenzy, uh, either because they are scared to challenge Donald Trump's stupidity or because, you know, they want to fundraise off of Donald Trump and make it seem as if they're fighting for Donald Trump. It's a tipping point in America right now. Yeah, it is. He's right about that. Not for the reasons he thinks. The election was stolen because you can see the charts and the graphs. I sat up that night watching it, and you see Donald Trump. The charts are going like this, and then all of a sudden they stopped counting. Woke up the next morning, and the graphs are going straight up. Man, that's, you know, <laughs> that's more evidence that I've heard. I think we're done with this video. Yeah, we're done. That's more evidence than I've heard from anyone. You know, the graph goes up like this, and then it goes up, and the numbers go up, and then it goes like this, and it goes like this. That's honestly, like, as incoherent as that was, he presented more evidence <laughs> than any other Trump supporter. Uh, look, let me just say this. If these weird jumps, weird to you in, in vote totals while they're counting the votes, is suspicious, then ask yourself this. Did you think that, you know, in the Georgia runoff race, when all of a sudden Warnock and Ossoff were leading by like 12, 13 points, and then seems like Loeffler and Purdue just suddenly made this huge gain because certain areas came in? Like, is that not suspicious to you? Did it seem like Republicans were stealing it? Or is it only election theft when you see these jumps happen that benefit Democrats? I think we know the answer. And the answer is whatever I want to believe. I don't need evidence. I just need my belief and I need to have faith and believe it's strong enough. Okay, so this next video is from CNN. Um, this is on January 4th. This is before the Georgia runoff race. And this has got to be the most batshit insane thing I've ever seen. Honestly, this CNN reporter, uh, he has talked to so many MAGA chuds. He has to be experiencing brain rot by now. So this is truly an American patriot for what he's doing. I, cu I couldn't talk to this many Trump supporters and not lose faith in humanity. But nonetheless, he's here. And what he documents is, is stunning. Do you think that Trump will eventually Trump accept that, that Biden is the next no, president? No, Biden is not the next Biden president. Biden isn't. Trump is the next president. I'm going to the inauguration for Trump. I've booked it before the election. They're saying this on January 4th. With the inauguration weeks away, they still believe Trump will be inaugurated. I just, I don't know what to say about this. So, will they believe that uh, when Biden is actually inaugurated and we can all see it on television? Like, do they think it's a false flag? Do they think that, like, this is some sort of shadow government and Trump is, like, actually still in charge? I just, like, I don't know. Like, I want to talk to these folks and pick their brains. I actually don't want to do that. But it's just, uh, what they're saying is batshit fucking insane. I don't know. I don't know how else to describe this. I have faith. He's going to be there and he's going to be do. He's going to be elected. So he'll be president. We'll see about that. More weeks. No, he will be president till 2024. You're saying this on January 4th. Oh, my gosh. Like, what else more needs to happen? Every single state certified the election results. The Electoral College voted. Uh, now, Congress has since certified. The only thing left is for Joe Biden to be sworn in. At what point do you think maybe there's just a small chance that I'm wrong? I don't think these people are capable of um, self-reflection. Practically every day since the election, new supposed evidence purporting to prove... Whoa! This dude looks familiar, doesn't he? This is one of the dudes who stormed the Capitol. Holy shit, this dude is everywhere. So he was in Georgia. And that actually, uh, isn't this the leader of the Proud Boys? They are busy. They're on the move. Joe Biden did not win 
circulates in the social media bubble Trump and his supporters live in. Hello, Georgia, by the way. There's no way we lost Georgia. There's no way. Two months since election day and just two weeks to Biden's inauguration, many are still refusing to accept reality. Stop them! Obviously, Trump is, is saying that the election was stolen from him in here in Georgia. Doesn't trust the uh, Republican election officials here. Does that cause a problem or an issue? Yeah, the Republicans. This the Republicans election? were complicit in stealing uh, the yes, election. I think it has for several people. Yeah, uh, people are not uh, have been demoralized and um, have actually told me that they um, do not want to vote because they feel like their vote isn't going to count. It yeah, that happens. For you when you're hearing from Trump supporters, Republican voters saying, I don't know if I'll even vote this week. Uh, yeah, but you know what? Most of them, after we talk to them, have voted. I've spent um, a lot of time last week calling people up. And, mm. and uh, the people who first said they, they weren't going to vote, after I spoke to them, they are going to vote. In Georgia, I'm so glad those Republicans ghouls lost. run the elections, right? Secretary yes. of State, all that. They've said they've investigated, investigated, investigated. They've counted three or four times. Right. And they said Biden has still won. Do you accept that? No, not all Republicans are good people just because they're yeah. Republicans. Trump is, keeps saying that he didn't actually lose. <laughs> like, why would Brian Kemp help Joe Biden steal the election? Like, Brian Kemp himself is a fucking scumbag. He oversaw his own election in 2018 when uh, he was running for governor against Stacey Abrams. He was the secretary of state overseeing his own election, purged black voters from the rolls, like limited polling locations. So this is a scumbag. Of course, he would prefer Trump win. Of all people, Brian Kemp, like you'd think that they'd believe he's a true Kool-Aid drinker, a true believer like they are. But, you know, you didn't tell us what we wanted to hear. So uh, you're a traitor. Fuck you. That's that's their thinking. The election was stolen. Do you think it's just time for him to, to give up and, and let Biden yeah. take over? Step up and say, let's walk away. Yeah. Okay. Let, let him do his job. Yeah. You're one of the, you're one of the only people today I've spoken to here who He's said that. genuinely but shocked. Why do you think that's important? Because it's showing who's the better person. You know, if you're going to continue fighting, what's the use? I mean, you know, if you've already lost it, let it go. Wait till next term. That a rare opinion at this Trump rally. Also rare, but worrying talk of civil war will you accept joe biden as president no he'll never be my president okay but you know you accept that he's going to be inaugurated no i don't i mean how could that change at this point <laughs> well it could be a civil war you never know oh there could you be a civil war a civil war do you i don't, we don't show us the voting machines show us the ballots show us that this was a fair what election. does that mean show us the we'll voting never machines accept another vote again ever <laughs> These dumb motherfuckers don't realize that you are capable as a U.S. citizen of auditing your own county's results. Like, you know that, right? But you're too lazy. You just want to believe what OAN and uh, Newsmax and Donald Trump tells you. And they always, you know, they'll agitate for a civil war and then they'll say, oh, well, I don't want that. Yeah, you do. That's what you're agitating for. You've shown that you have the capacity as a movement, a quote unquote movement to get violent. And that's what you want. If you think that... Uh, you know, a civil war would lead to Donald Trump remaining in power. That's exactly what you would opt for. You've all proven yourself. You've shown your cards. Now, this video is from the same reporter. This is on the day where the uh, pro-Trump mob stormed the U.S. Capitol. Uh, their response is here when he asked them basic questions about if they're proud of what they did. Is uh, It should be embarrassing, but they have no shame. Are you proud of what happened here today? I'm absolutely uh, standing behind 100% what happened here today. 1,000%. I think it's terrible how this election was stolen. And I had to come here and do my patriotic duty. One aspect that um, a lot of folks probably didn't even think about, uh, I hadn't either, is how much uh, that event is going to be like a COVID super spreader. And uh, it's... These folks are going to be sick because none of them are wearing masks or very few of them were wearing masks. It's just they think that they are doing the patriotic thing. You know, if you believe a, a democracy is at stake and the election was stolen, you try to stop that from happening. So they've been, you know, uh, duped by Donald Trump at OAN and, and whatnot. And so these right wing uh, media outlets and pundits, you know, Charlie Kirk, Dave Rubin, all these folks 
they bear a lot of the blame for this behavior. Now, of course, individual responsibility is something that's important. Like, they have to be more responsible consumers of media. But having said that, though, like, when you work people into a frenzy to that extent, I think that you, you share a lot of the blame. Uh, you guys just left the Capitol grounds? Yep. Are you proud of the scenes that, that, that played out here today? I'm not proud of it. I'm humbled by it and that um, I'm excited that for 1776, the we the people movement is moving forward. Should yeah. it Trump it's sad. It's sad that it has to happen. Are you proud of what happened here today? I'm proud that the Patriots came out today to show their support for our president because he is, Donald Trump is our president. Well, I mean, but what does this achieve? It's just shocking how many people will like admit that they uh, trespassed. They like straight up went in there, committed a crime, uh, felonies. They'll go on camera. The dude with the, the horns um, in the last video that we saw, he was actually interviewed. He gave like his first name, last name, spelled it out. I mean, these folks are basically like doxing themselves. Uh, so they have absolutely no concern whatsoever that they're going to be prosecuted when the FBI is actually looking to prosecute some of them. Uh, it's just you think that they would have at least some buy into the world that they live in, like the things that they can see around them. But to them, it's just whatever they want to believe. I mean, like imagine not living in the real world like this, where if something is inconvenient that you don't like, you just reject it. I mean, I am not a Joe Biden supporter. I supported Bernie Sanders unequivocally. Like to make myself feel better, I guess I could just like pretend like Bernie Sanders is the president. But what good is that going to do? Like, Accepting reality is an important part of life because if you don't accept reality, you can't function in reality, in society. And we have so many folks who just who don't accept basic reality. And this is really bad. This violence. Uh, are we violent? There's no violence. Are we violent? There's no violence. There's violent? There's people have been hurt. Oh, There's no not violent. Violent. Wrong. You're literally rejecting now what you like see in front of your face. You're just fucking stupid. God damn. Look at that smug fucking look on her face. Wrong. Like what a fucking moron you are, lady. Jesus Christ. These fucking people. <laughs> A way that a president should be behaving after Absolutely. losing Absolutely, yes. Yes. It's time yeah, that they clear out the swamp. Okay, We're this back. lady right here, with like how animated she is, like Donald Trump could literally like spread his ass cheeks and shit down her throat and tell her it's chocolate and she would believe it. Like that's how far gone she is. Like she has overdosed on the Kool-Aid and she's fucking like she's off her rocker. Like goddamn. For to have them cheat and steal from us constantly. That's right. We're over it. No and, and more. And we're peaceful. And yeah, we're peaceful. We're not. We will not be silent, though. Is this an appropriate way? You're not to like be who? Antifa. After losing an election. I, I absolutely. We have to, as American patriots, we have to do what we can to take back this country. Oh fuck off. Okay, one last video. This is not of um him talking to people. He is uh, basically sharing his insight. This dude has uh, been to far too many uh, Trump rallies, and he's basically explaining what he sees. And his conclusion is pretty obvious, but nonetheless, I think it's still really important. Uh, he, he explains who the culprits are. He just sees all these folks regurgitating the same exact things he hears from OAN, which regurgitates what Trump says. That's right, Chess, Aaron. I mean, after years of enabling uh, hate speech and conspiracy theories, these social media companies, which have made billions of dollars off all of this and who are complicit, yeah, to be honest, they are. complicit in a lot of what we saw, the violence we saw on the streets of Washington yesterday, uh, finally took some unprecedented steps to stop Trump's nonsense. They have never, ever taken the action that they took yesterday. Uh, Twitter, as you mentioned, suspending uh, Trump from tweeting for 12 hours. We have never seen that action before. Of course, it's all a bit too little, too late. And you know what was really striking yesterday, Aaron, was as we were on the ground and with those uh, Trump supporters and, and members of that mob, 
everybody was just repeating the same thing. They were repeating the conspiracy theories that they read on Facebook, that yep. they hear on OAN or on certain segments on Fox News, and they were repeating the conspiracy theorists that the conspiracy theories that Trump has been pushing from his Twitter and Facebook and YouTube accounts uh, for years. And yesterday, as uh, as as supporters were finally leaving the Capitol after breaking in, uh, I asked some of them if they were proud of what had happened here yesterday. Have a listen. Are you proud of what happened here today? Absolutely. I think we should have gone. Absolutely. Okay, so he's just going to play clips from what we just watched. Yeah, I think everything he's saying is right. Um, you know, these uh, these social media companies, they've basically become right-wing echo chambers and so much misinformation spreads on on Facebook. Like, if you have anyone in your family who is, like, over the age of 70 on Facebook, you know, they they see a meme and they mistake it for news. I, I've had, like, my crazy aunts share these types of pro-Trump memes and I've removed them from my feed because I don't want to see that bullshit. But, like, you, you'd think that at a time when we have seemingly infinite knowledge at our fingertips, we all have smartphones, uh, we're dumber than ever because we don't seek out new information. We don't challenge ourselves. We don't actually want new knowledge. We just find whatever weird echo chamber exists online that will uh, confirm our existing biases. And we get dumber as a result. Like this, what we're seeing here, this is like a virus. This is brain rot. Like how do we deprogram all of these people? There, there's too many. Like I don't know what to do. I don't know what it's gonna take. How do we convince these people to come back to reality and live in reality. I know we can't wait until the next generation comes to power because by then climate change will have already like devoured, you know, portions of the world. So I, I just, I don't know. There's this urgency, but also really eh, the obstacles seem insurmountable. You know, how we go forward as a country, I just don't know. The trajectory that we're on is very, very bad. Uh, so we have to find a way to take the folks who are presumably too far gone and make them see the light. And this is a project that I, I wouldn't even know where to begin. I don't even know where to begin. Because they don't think that it's them, you know, who's the problem. They think it's us who's the problem. And if we just came to their side, then the country would be unified. When what they're asking for is like crazy shit. They want Trump to just be like a dictator. Uh, they want to uh, let the Republicans do whatever, you know, deregulate industries. And we already have, you know, a neoliberal party in the Democrats. So we don't need to turn that up to a 500 with Republicans. I just, I don't know. Like, this is a really troubling time in, in American history. And um, if we can overcome this as a society, then I'll feel a lot more optimistic about our future. But when you have this many, many people who don't believe in basic reality, reject what they see in front of their eyes, it's just it's sad it's sad it's demoralizing and the task ahead of us at trying to fix this country is absolutely daunting um yeah so i will leave that there uh, i feel like these videos crushed my soul but i mean how could you not feel demoralized at at the time you know america is in such a bad spot josh hawley is one of just over a dozen gop senators who is very explicitly coming out against democracy and is refusing to certify the results of the November election. Taking a stand and basically saying, I don't believe in democracy anymore. I think that we should have a monarchy and Trump should be king. And that's what they're doing. Because if, if they were successful in this laughable effort, which is inevitably going to fail, and they got what they wanted, it would end democracy as we know it. So by coming out and putting their names on the record, I think that's good because we need to know who the authoritarians are. But this is outrageous. And for the record, these are the individuals who are very explicitly admitting that they don't support democracy. They're against democracy. So the fact that there are that many, I mean, even though thankfully most Republicans aren't on board with this, the fact that there's more than a dozen, that tells you this party is so far gone, so extreme that they were irredeemable, and the only way to save America might be for the party to collapse. If it doesn't collapse, then I don't know how we go forward as a country when you have some individuals now who are quite literally against democracy. So it's outrageous. Like, even though it's going to fail, it's still outrageous. We need people to buy into the system and believe in democracy. So it's, we know what this is. This is political posturing. Ted Cruz is the one who's leading this effort. We know he hates Donald Trump. 
but they're doing this because they want to be the heirs to the Trump throne. This is them telling Trump's base, listen, I am a Kool-Aid drinker. I'm part of the cult. Accept me. I'm even doing this. I'm literally trying to stop democracy from happening. That's how much I support Donald Trump. Please let me be the next president. Please let me be the next Donald Trump. That's what this is about. But regardless of what this is about, even if it's for political expediency, this is dangerous. This is bad for democracy. To have anyone, even if it's political theater, trying to stop democracy, that's bad. And people are angry about it, rightfully so. So there was a small group of individuals that showed up in front of Josh Hawley's house to protest. And this is what he claims happened. Quote, Tonight, while I was in Missouri, Antifa scumbags came to our place in D.C. and threatened my wife and newborn daughter who can't travel. They screamed threats, vandalized, and tried to pound open our door. Let me be clear. My family and I I will not be intimidated by left-wing violence. So he's saying that in response to people who are rightfully outraged that he supports authoritarianism, they tried to do violence. Thank God they weren't successful. Like, they tried to pound down the door with his wife and newborn. I mean, what were they going to do? Like, beat him up? Like, what was the end game here, right? This sounds really serious. Except the problem is that he's a liar. What happened in actuality is like nine people showed up and they held a candlelight vigil. And this is what shut down DC. The group who organized the event said it was as well. It was less than an hour, and they did a candlelight vigil. To which Holly responded, saying, Now, quote-unquote, vigil means screaming threats through bullhorns, vandalizing property, pounding on the doors of homes, and terrorizing innocent people and children. So, regardless of what shut down DC says... He is maintaining that this wasn't some peaceful candlelight vigil. This was a violent event. It sounds like Antifa extremists showed up to his home with pitchforks. They vandalized his property and uh, they were threatening his wife. Um, he's lying and it's not just that he's lying. He got caught lying. Even the police in the area who responded to the event are saying... This isn't what happened. As the St. Louis Post-Dispatch reports, police say protesters outside Senator Josh Hawley's home were peaceful. And they explain, officers were called to Hawley's home in Vienna, a Washington suburb, around 7.45 p.m. after someone reported that there were people protesting in front of the house. Officers who responded to the scene found that the people were peaceful, said Master Police Officer Juan Vasquez, a spokesman for the town of Vienna Police Department. Vasquez said the protesters had been violating several laws, including a Virginia code about picketing in front of a house, a town ordinance about making noise in front of a home, and a littering code, but he said the officers explained the violations and everyone just left. There were no issues, no arrests, he said. We didn't think it was that big of a deal. That's the police that are saying this. We didn't think it was that big of a deal. That is a quote verbatim. But Josh Hawley's saying, I'm the victim. They vandalized my property. They threatened me. They were pounding on my door trying to get in. This is serious. But the police say, no. But if you don't believe the police, and if you're a right-winger, I'm assuming you do, because you always talk about backing the blue, right? So you're going to believe that they're trustworthy. If you don't believe the police, then I've got more for you. We have the entire 50-minute-long video where the protesters filmed the event. And these are some moments from the event. You're going to see how hostile these Antifa extremists were. Um, what's the what's the first chant you're going to lead us in? Well, I... Holly, Holly, what do you say? How many votes are you suppressing today? Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. I don't know. That's one. I, I'll come up with others. <laughs> okay. Um, we, we got a couple blocks. <laughs> so, I welcome... Uh, we do have I like you and <laughs> I just heard <laughs> with the candles it looks kind of sweet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, okay. 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 Go for it. Okay. So somebody has Holy, holy shame on you! Biden, Harris, through and through. Holy, holy shame on you! Biden, Harris, through and through. Due diligence has been done. Biden, Harris, have won. Due diligence have been done. 
Biden and Harris have won. Our government is allowing thousands of individuals to come to our city with no mask on, knowing that coronavirus cases are big as hell. So therefore, we're going to hold people accountable and hold political officials accountable who are trying to swindle the election, swindle democracy, and don't give a rat's ass about the American people. So when democracy is under attack, what do we do? What do we do? When democracy is under attack, what do we do? What do we do? So I'm sorry that our voices are fighting for democracy is an inconvenience to your lives. But let me tell you something. The black and brown lives that are being brutalized and murdered in the United States by the United States government, that's why we're here. Well, I mean, after seeing that, I totally understand why he feared for his family's life. I mean, when you have this small group of people chanting pro-Biden and Harris slogans, I mean, clearly, I can't help but think these must be Antifa extremists because we know how much the far left and Antifa love Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> and in case you missed it, there was a glimpse of the vandalism he was referring to. Of course, it's this. <laughs> Chalk on the sidewalk where they wrote Trump lost. That is what I'm guessing, anyways, that he interpreted as a uh, as vandalism. And this is what I'm assuming he said uh, was them trying to pound down his door. Uh, I don't even know if they were knocking. I couldn't tell in the video. It looked like they were like setting down a sign and a candle on his doorstep. But it doesn't necessarily look like there's this angry mob of people trying to pound down his door and break into his home. But I mean, in case you're wondering, uh, because I'm a far left extremist, if I'm just like cherry picking certain moments from the event that don't actually fully encapsulate the protest. Well, let's uh, scrub through it real quick. I'll link you to the full video down below. But as you can see, uh, they discuss their protest in the parking lot, talk about what they want to say. They then walk towards his house. They stand outside with some bullhorns. A cop comes and says that it's illegal to protest in front of residential areas. Areas, they politely say that they'll leave and then that's it they leave and that's all that happened but he's the victim guys the right-wing persecution complex is real they desperately want to be the victims so that way you know normal americans feel sympathetic towards them so they don't feel as angry when they see them fucking us over and uh literally trying to overthrow democracy and like for what you're doing if I was a politician and I was literally trying to stage a coup and overthrow democracy, I would be thankful that that's the harshest form of protest that we see. He should be thankful that they're not trying to, like, get him to resign and they're protesting in his office in Congress every single day. But you try to overthrow democracy and that's the worst you get and you're still mad? It's just unbelievable. Either you buy into our system of democracy believe that us voting who our leaders are is what we should continue doing or you don't but when you try to take away the voice from the people they will express their anger by yes sometimes protesting in front of your house it got your attention didn't it it worked you seem to be listening so i don't know what else to say uh josh hawley He's lying about this, and he was busted lying, but he's still lying. If this doesn't tell you that Josh Hawley is a liar and a fraud, then nothing else will. It is absolutely hilarious to me that conservatives in America insist that really it's them. They're the ones who are pro-life. In actuality, that applies to just a very narrow issue, abortion. But when it comes to protecting human beings actually putting this belief that human life is valuable into practice, offering people universal health care, ending wars, they're not very pro-life. And they've really gone full mask off during this pandemic when almost immediately after it began, they recommended sacrificing grandma to the gods of capitalism in order to make sure that we don't hurt the economy. Now, you'd think that after all of this time, they'd learn that you don't get to choose between saving the economy and human lives because if human beings aren't flourishing, the economy, which needs human beings to function, also wouldn't flourish. But they've just disregarded any sense of uh, reason and logic. And now they, they want to pretend as if the pandemic is over when it's at the worst it's ever been. 
So you'll see how pro-life they are, you know, as they reject health care to people and financial assistance to people during a pandemic. And you're really going to see how pro-life these so-called pro-life conservatives are when uh, they are now actively encouraging people to just straight up defy lockdown orders, which are essential to save lives and stop hospitals from becoming overrun, which is literally happening right, right now. But Charlie Kirk uh, on his podcast, he encouraged his thousands, perhaps millions of viewers to go and defy lockdown orders. And if you don't, you're part of the problem. This is literally something that he thought was a good idea to say to an audience that's probably really large. Take a look. So before I get into uh, what tape do, you want to, do we have the tape from the John Fredericks to show all the fraud that's happening yeah, in Georgia? Before we get into this, I just have to give like a 30 second question. Why is America still locked down? Why do we not have everything open completely and totally? No mask mandates. Make a decision as you see fit. If you're afraid of the virus, stay at home. This has been one of the most disappointing chapters in American history. How we have tolerated these lockdowns that are anti-scientific, anti-human. We have people committing suicide, drug addiction. And by the way, you try and go find accurate suicide data. Do you notice the states aren't publishing them? They're not publishing them because they're actually going to find out that more people, young people are committing suicide than dying from the Chinese, dying from the Chinese coronavirus. It is a disgrace and we're letting it, everyone's letting it happen. But we at Turning Point USA, we hosted the largest event of the entire year in Florida. We did an amazing job. So if you are not actively defying these state and city ordinances, you're part of the problem. Okay, so let's uh, let's go to John Fredericks, who goes to show that our election in Georgia um, is being corrupted with. Play tape. I love how that insane rant about COVID lockdowns was sandwiched between this idiotic conspiracy theory about how the election in Georgia was fraudulent when we literally just listen to the phone call where the president of the United States, which you support, is trying to get the secretary of state of Georgia to commit an act of election fraud. Like, it's hilarious to me. Words have no meanings. Fraud just means whatever they think uh, it hurts them. It's insane. Uh, but what he says here, it, it shows you that Charlie Kirk is either dumb or disingenuous. And I mistakenly said before that I think that even though He's wrong about everything. He at least is somewhat intelligent. Now I'm questioning that. I, I think he's probably stupid. Like, I think he's now getting into Dave Rubin territory. Like, that's that's where we're at. Uh, he says, why is America still locked down? Why do we not have everything open completely and totally? No mask mandates and make a decision as you see fit. Why? I don't know. Maybe it's because of the pandemic is that the worst it's ever been? And this isn't about individual liberty. Not wearing a mask isn't about someone's personal decision. If I don't wear a mask, I could potentially infect you. If you don't wear a mask, you could potentially infect me. So it's not a personal decision to choose to not wear a mask. You're making a decision for someone else. You're choosing to spread your germs on other people during a pandemic. That's the point of masks, to prevent us from spreading, spreading our germs to other people. So this isn't about individual liberty. If you choose to not wear a mask, you are infringing on the liberty of other individuals, you fucking idiot. And he says, if you're afraid of the virus, stay home. Yeah, well, why don't you tell that to people who work with the public? who don't have the option to stay home. If they don't stay, if they uh, don't go to work, then they can't pay rent. They don't have the luxury of staying home. So explain to them why, if you're afraid of the virus, just stay home. If he said that, but then also said, you know what, we have to give everyone $2,000 per month, I'd say, all right, you know what, that's fine. I can understand your rationale, but he's not saying that. If you're paying people to stay home, that's a different story, but people cannot stay home. So you're basically just inadvertently pushing for herd immunity without actually saying the words. He also says that the lockdowns are anti-scientific, they're anti-human, and we have people committing suicide and drug addiction. And I've heard this from conservatives before as well, and this is a real concern. Of course, these lockdowns are isolating. Prolonged lockdowns are not good for our mental health. I agree with the concern there, but he doesn't actually care because if he truly cared about people's mental health, what would he be doing? He'd be pushing someone like Donald Trump, who he has influence over, to offer more expansion of mental health coverage. Maybe we should make mental health care in America free. Maybe we should make health care in America free, but you don't want to do that. 
So you claim to care about mental health, but really all I see is you just using that. Like you're exploiting a subject, trying to pull on the heartstrings of people disingenuously so, when you don't actually care about people's mental health. If you care about mental health, you would advocate for making healthcare free, for making mental health care free, even temporarily during a pandemic, but you're not even fucking doing the bare minimum, so spare me. And the worst part of that entire video is when he says this, if you are not actively defying these state and city ordinances, you're part of the problem. So he is quite literally encouraging people to go out in public, pretend like the pandemic isn't a thing, not wear a mask, and this is going to get people killed. Charlie Kirk, by saying that, the people who listen to him and believe him and trust him, they're going to do this, and some of them are going to get sick and may die. So let me ask you this, Charlie Kirk. Are you going to take responsibility if any of your viewers die and get sick due to COVID-19? Are you going to admit that the blood is on your hands, someone who's supposedly pro-life, if this does in fact happen? Are you going to foot the bill for their burial services or their funerals if they take your advice and they defy lockdown because they have a misunderstanding of what liberty means because they're entitled? Are you going to take responsibility for that, Charlie Kirk? This is just unreal. Um, and a lot of people oftentimes argue correctly so, I think, that conservatives, they never care about an issue unless it affects them, unless it hits close to home. You know, Meghan McCain had a baby and now she stresses the importance of maternity leave. Dick Cheney, you know, uh, he suddenly cared about gay marriage when he found out his daughter was a lesbian. So you think that, okay, well, Charlie Kirk maybe just has to know someone who was affected by COVID-19. Maybe he has to be affected by it personally, but he was. Look at this headline. Turning Point USA co-founder dies of COVID-19. Someone who co-founded the organization that he runs Someone who he knows personally, probably closely, has died, and he's still not taking it seriously. It's just, it's a joke to him. And if he does personally take it seriously, but he's still saying this because it's poli politically expedient and it's what's popular in right-wing circles, then I don't know what to say. You're just, you're just the scumbag. But either way, this is disgusting. But I mean, that's, that's one way that the far right is, is responding to COVID-19. You have some individuals like Dave Rubin who are just conspiracy mongering and trying to raise doubts about the severity of it, particularly in states like California, which are experiencing really, really bad outbreaks. This is totally anecdotal, but I, you know, I keep seeing that they're saying like something like, uh, all, uh, not, not all of them, but we're seeing like, oh, 90% of the hospital beds in, uh, in California are overtaken. SoCal and LA, all the hospital beds are overtaken. There's two hospitals that I live about 10 minutes between, and I drove by both yesterday, and they're pretty much empty. I did not go in and check every bed, so I'm just telling you what I can see on the outside, which are pretty much empty parking lots and the lines for COVID testing that are completely empty and everything else. So it's just like, what's going on here? What's going on here? I don't know. I'm just... I'm just asking you the questions. See, I can't see evidence that this is as severe as I'm told it is. So I doubt that it's really that serious at all. And look, don't get mad at me. I'm just asking questions. I know exactly how my far right audience will interpret what I'm saying. I know what I'm doing, but I'm just asking questions. It's not that big of a deal. Dave Rubin is an absolute fucking clown. And I know that he doesn't believe what he's saying. He knows that... By saying that, you look like you're a rebel. You look like you're standing up for liberty, but in actuality, you're a fucking fraud. Downplaying the severity of COVID-19. Conspiracy mongering. And uh, I want to share this tweet that Lauren Steiner, an activist on Twitter, shared that really puts things into perspective. Quote, the LA County EMS has directed ambulance crews not to transport patients with little chance of survival to hospitals and to conserve the use of oxygen. That's what's happening right now. But I can't see lots of cars in the parking lots of hospitals, so it must not be real. It must not be as severe as people are telling me it is, as the numbers indicate. Additionally, they are trying to discharge COVID patients and all patients as quickly as possible because they're reaching full capacity if they haven't already reached it. But Dave Rubin, he has to see the cars. He drove by like two hospitals, guys. So, must not be as severe as he says it is. We've only had, what, more than 350,000 deaths in America? What is it going to take? 500,000? 700,000? A million? By then, will it be a serious enough 
illness for you? I mean, what is it going to take? And the answer is, uh, there is no line. Like, it doesn't matter what threshold we cross. We could lose a million Americans, and they're still going to say the same fucking thing because they have a political agenda. And apparently, now, uh, a pandemic is a political issue. In reality, like, COVID-19 doesn't have a party affiliation. It doesn't care if you're a Republican. It doesn't care if you're a Democrat. It is a virus, and it is infecting people. So whether you take it seriously or not will determine if you're affected or if you're going to infect other people or if other people will infect you. And so we need people to take it seriously. We need them to stay home. We need them to know how bad it is in certain states. But you have far-right lunatics who are trying to contradict that. And it's just, it, it's deeply dangerous. And I don't know how these goons sleep at night. But, um, you know, you can only have so much money profit off of the misinformation that you spread. But, I mean, you still got to look yourself in the mirror at the end of the day. And I want to think that they have trouble sleeping. I want to think that they feel bad about the things that they say and do. But I just, I think that these are just soulless ghouls who don't care. I'm sad to say that I'm not surprised by this, but I'm not surprised by this. We learned that there will be no charges against the police officer that shot Jacob Blake in the back seven times. We saw the video, and we'll go over it again. I don't know how any reasonable human being can watch that video and not deduce that this was an attempted murder. The officer was very clearly trying to kill Jacob Blake, but yet... No charges. So, for more on this, we go to CBS News, where Aaron Donahue reports no charges will be filed against the white police officer who shot a black man in the back over the summer in Kenosha, Wisconsin, the district attorney announced Tuesday. Kenosha police officer Rustin Chesky had been responding to a domestic dispute on August 23rd when he fired seven times at Jacob Blake as Blake was trying to get inside an SUV. Blake's three young children were in the backseat. Investigators have said they found a knife inside the vehicle, but his family has denied that he was armed. Blake was left paralyzed after the shooting, which was captured on disturbing video that drew national outrage and several nights of unrest in Kenosha. Ben Crump, Patrick A. Salvi II, and B. Ivory Lamar, lawyers for Blake's family, said in a statement, they are immensely disappointed in District Attorney Michael Gravely's decision. Quote, we feel this decision failed not only Jacob and his family, but the community that protected and demanded justice, the statement said. Yeah, I think that's the understatement of the century. This failed the community. It failed every single black and brown person in America who fears for their lives whenever they interact with police officers. I mean, <sighs> this is just really demoralizing. And I want to go over the footage again because seeing it, it really reiterates how outrageous this decision is. So look at this footage and ask yourself this. Does this officer, who's using deadly force against the civilian, appear to be in danger in any way at all? I mean, let's assume the worst about Jacob Blake. He allegedly had a knife in his vehicle. So let's assume that not only is that true, but let's assume he was going to get that knife and physically attack one of the officers with it. Does the response to shoot him in the back seven times appear to be a proportionate response to that? Of course it doesn't. No reasonable human being can deduce that it does. We don't even know why Jacob Blake was going to his vehicle. We don't know if the knife that was allegedly there was going to be used by him. For all we know, it was a pocket knife, which lots of people carry around. We don't know. But he was shot in the back seven times with children in the car. It's just... <sighs> this is an attempted murder, but... At a minimum, you would expect manslaughter. Maybe the officer was like not right in his head, but we get nothing. He gets away scot-free. And it's especially outrageous because over the summer in 2020, we saw the largest civil rights movement perhaps in human history, maybe. I mean, we had the protests break out in Minneapolis, and then they took place across the country and even in other cities around the world. Like, many of us have never seen something like this before. And what happened? Nothing. Nothing. Congress was completely unmoved. We got zero action. We got some action at the state and local level, but nationally speaking, our lawmakers were completely unmoved by that.
And not only did we get zero reform when it comes to police brutality, we're still seeing the same exact thing where police officers can attempt to murder, if not actually murder, black and brown people and get away with it. I mean, this isn't the first time. Darren Wilson, Mike Brown, and now Jacob Blake is just, you know, another statistic now. He gets no justice. It's just, it's absurd, and I don't know what to say. Like, it feels as if we live in a failed state. Like, this this doesn't happen in an advanced society that protects its own citizens. If its own citizens don't feel as if they're safe in their own communities, then that's a failure of the state, of the government. This state-sanctioned violence and murder that keeps happening, this doesn't happen in a society, in a regime that's capable of addressing the concerns of its citizens. So I see this, and it's not shocking, but it's still outrageous. It's just, I don't know what else to say. There are no words to discuss how grotesque this is, how much of a joke our judicial system is. So I'll leave that there, because at this point I'm just ranting, and I know that you all feel it, but this is, this is, <laughs> it's hurtful. Like, if you are a black and brown person, and you see this, you see another instance where a police officer does this and there's no charges like what is the thought of course you think that your life it it doesn't matter you think that you're you're meaningless to the state they don't care about you and their actions indicate that that's correct so it's just it's so sad it's heartbreaking to see this once again where a police officer is getting away with attempted murder the only you know uh silver lining is that Thankfully, Jacob Blake survived somehow, but I mean, he's he's paralyzed, but his survival is a miracle in and of itself. I just wish that there was at least a tiny, tiny chance that there would be justice, but I mean, really, the conclusion was that the likelihood of there being justice was always very small from the beginning, even though the video went viral and, you know, catalyzed protests. This is just what we've expected as the norm in America, and even when we attempt to change it, and protests in cities across the country during a pandemic, nothing happens, and we still get the same result. So, you know, it's just, it's deeply demoralizing and depressing to see this again and again and again. I already know that I'm a bit late to the party in the Trump call uh, with uh, Brad Raffensperger, the Secretary of State of Georgia, but I've got to talk about this because this is genuinely it's shocking, even for Donald Trump, and I get that a lot of us were desensitized to the shenanigans that we see on a daily basis, but for a United States president to do what he did, this really is a new low, and when I say that, it doesn't sound persuasive, because when we're talking about Donald Trump, there's always a new low, but the low has been lower than it's ever been, like the bar is below the floor, and he managed to um, still surprise me. So in this call with Brad Raffensperger, he is trying to convince him basically to steal the election for him. Now, even if Brad Raffensperger listened to what Donald Trump wanted and did what he wanted, it still would not be enough at this point to secure him another four years. Nonetheless, listen to what he says. This is some authoritarian, dictatorial shit you're about to hear. The, having a correct, you, the people of Georgia are angry, and these numbers are going to be repeated on Monday night, along with others that we're going to have by that time, which are much more substantial even, and the people of Georgia are angry, the people of the country are angry, and there's nothing wrong with saying that, you know, uh, that you've recalculated. Well, Mr. President, the challenge that you have is the data you have is wrong. Now. Do you think it's possible that they uh, shredded ballots in uh, Fulton County? Because that's what the rumor is. And also that Dominion took out machines. Uh, that Dominion is really moving fast to get rid of their uh, machinery. Do you know anything about that? Because that's illegal. No, Ryan, Germany. No, Dominion is not um, moved any machinery out of Fulton County. We're having. Well, but no, but election. but have they moved? Have they? Have they moved the inner parts of the machines and replaced them with other parts? No. Are you sure, Ryan? I'm sure. You should want to have an accurate election. 
and you're a Republican. We believe that we do have an accurate election. No, I no, you don't. No, no, you don't. You don't have. You don't have. Not even close. You got. You're off by hundreds of thousands of votes. You know what they did, and you're not reporting it. That's a. You know that's a criminal. That's a criminal offense. And and you know you can't let that happen. That's that's a big risk to you and to Ryan, your lawyer. That's a big risk. But they are shredding ballots, in my opinion, based on what I've heard. And they are removing machinery, uh, and they're moving it as fast as they can, both of which are criminal fines, and you can't let it happen, and you are letting it happen. You know, I mean, I'm notifying you that you're letting it happen. So, look, all I want to do is this. I just want to find uh, 11,780 votes, which is one more than we have, because we won the state. So, so tell me, Brad, what are we going to do? We won the election, and it's not fair to take it away from us like this. And it's going to be very costly in many ways. And I think you have to say that you're going to reexamine it, and you can reexamine it, but, but reexamine it with people that want to find answers, not people that don't want to find answers. Uh, for instance, I'm hearing Ryan, and he's probably... I'm sure a great lawyer and everything, but he's making statements about those ballots that he doesn't know. But he's making them with such he he did make them with surety, but now I think he's less sure because the answer is they all went to Biden, and that alone wins us the election by a lot. You know, so. Mr. President, uh, you have people that submit information, and we have our people that submit information. And then it comes before the court, and the court then has to make a determination. We have to stand by our numbers. We believe our numbers are right. Well, under law, you're not allowed to give faulty election results, okay? You're not allowed to do that, and that's what you've done. That's shocking. It's Donald Trump, but he's still a United States president. And you had a U.S. president say, I just want to find 11,780 votes which is one more than we have because we won the state. This is unbelievable. Unbelievable. And he just, he doesn't, he doesn't get it. He doesn't realize that he lost. And even if Brad Raffensperger obliged, you still need to win Pennsylvania and Wisconsin. Like Georgia alone is not enough for you to win this election. So he's insane. He is downright insane. And I was a little bit skeptical about whether or not he actually believed that he win. But after this call, uh, he believes it. Like, there's there's no doubt about it now in my mind. He actually believes he won. Like, I think he's convinced himself that he's won. So he's bought into his own delusions, in other words. And he's just, he's a sick man, mentally speaking. He is, he's really, really ill. And it's almost sad it's almost sad. Like, if he wasn't such a bad person, I would feel compassionate for him because of how far gone he is. Like, he, this is someone who is not healthy. He's not all there. And again, I've said this before, his family, the fact that they're not stepping in and trying to talk some sense into him is astounding to me. It is astounding to me. He then goes on to suggest that the uh, Republicans in Georgia, uh, Kelly Loeffler, David Perdue, all of this is going to cost them the election if Brad Raffensperger doesn't cheat for Donald Trump. And it's funny, as he literally asks Brad Raffensperger to find votes for him, which is illegal, it's an impeachable offense. I mean, we don't have much time, but it is a, an impeachable offense. As he does all of this, he sounds like an actual mob boss, but not like the ones you see in movies, like the ones that you see in like these slapstick comedies, like not the serious movies, but the ones where they're like fucking uh, falling over themselves and, you know, walking into doors. We're talking like Corky Romano level mob boss. That's what we're talking about here. Because the things he says, like he, he doesn't just say, find me the votes. He also implies heavily so that if Brad Raffensperger doesn't break the law, then he's doing something that's illegal because you're complicit. You see fraud taking place and you're not saying anything as Secretary of State. That's illegal. 
maybe there's going to be consequences for you. Like it's again, like I, 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 I'm struggling to find the words to respond to this. No amount of commentary can add to this. Like this speaks for itself. It speaks for itself. Quote, there's nothing wrong with saying we've recalculated. He's literally trying to convince him to lie. Now, there are other um, lines that stood out, not in that particular audio clip. Quote, as you know, every single state, we won every state. He said we won every state. He thinks he won all 50 states in this last election. That is, I mean, to call it delusion, it doesn't do it justice. Like, we need a new word. He's not just delusional. Like, he's crafted an entirely new reality. And he's living in that reality. And that, from an individual standpoint, is is troubling because he has power. But the fact that people are joining him in said reality. You have Marjorie Taylor Greene, QAnon conspiracy theorist, now a member of Congress, showing up with a mask on that says Trump won. I mean, I'm glad she's wearing a mask, but that is insane. This is literally cult-level bullshit that we're seeing. Uh, also, he says, so dead people voted, and I think the number is close to 5,000 people. Completely just pulled that out of his ass. Um, uh, you had out-of-state voters. They voted in Georgia, but they were from out-of-state. Of 4,925, you had absentee ballots sent to vacant. Uh, they were absentee ballots sent to vacant addresses. Yeah, there's no evidence for any of this. The only evidence that we have of somebody who's dead voting is a Republican doing it, using his dead mother to vote for Donald Trump a second time. That's literally the only shred of evidence that we've seen of voter fraud committed because statistically it is insignificant not enough to change the results of an election because it's not really worth it like who wants to commit voter fraud when the payoff isn't that high it's just what an extra vote or so but the consequences are tremendous it's a felony who wants to do that that's why it's very uncommon um so listen if we assumed that his delusions were true and everything he said was correct he still doesn't get that that's not enough for him to win. If Georgia flips, it's not enough for him to win. And I get why he's focusing on Georgia. It's because it's controlled by Republicans, so they should be doing what he wants, theoretically, right? But that's still not enough. So the fact that you believe you won, not just Georgia, but every state, there are no words for this. Like, we really are going to need some space between now and the time when we actually try to dissect this, because while we're in the moment, this is too much. Like, but when historians look back at this moment, they're going to be shocked at the era that we're in right now. It is absolutely as bizarre as it can possibly be. And the saddest part isn't Donald Trump. The saddest part is that people believe him when he says this. When he says we wanted 50 states, people believe that. When he says that, you know, um, there's nothing wrong with lying and saying we recalculated. People believe him and they think, yeah, why can't you just say that? Why can't you just say Donald Trump won, Brad Raffensperger? I mean, <laughs> this is just so bizarre. And we're getting to a point now where he's going to be out soon. So is he actually going to like flip the desk in the Oval Office and like try to barricade himself in? I kind of want to see it. I'm not going to lie. I kind of want to see it. It would be bad for democracy, but it would be very entertaining. And it's looking like he might actually just refuse to leave. I don't know what's going to happen, but Jesus Christ, this is just what a weird Twilight Zone universe that we're living in. Like this timeline is clearly the stupidest of all the parallel universes. Like what the fuck? So believe it or not, I actually have some surprisingly good news. The United States government's case against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, the extradition case against him, it has failed. A British judge has turned it down, and the reasoning for turning this down is really interesting to me. It tells us a little bit about how the world sees us, but let me just say before we get to the specifics that this is a win for the First Amendment. I mean, this isn't final news. Of course, the United States government will appeal this decision, but for now, this is really important because the precedent that this would set if the U.S. government was successful in extraditing him and then prosecuting him subsequently, 
it would be a disaster for journalism in the United States and the First Amendment. So the fact that this attempt has failed, we should all breathe a little bit easier for now, knowing that Julian Assange will not be extradited to the United States for prosecution. Uh, but having said that, though, let's get to the specifics of the case. As Ben Quinn of The Guardian reports, Julian Assange will make a fresh bid to be released from prison on Wednesday after a British judge ruled that he cannot be extradited to the U.S. to face charges of espionage and of hacking government computers. Lawyers for U.S. authorities are appealing against the ruling at the Old Bailey, which rejected arguments that the WikiLeaks co-founder would not get a fair trial in the United States, but blocked extradition on the basis that procedures in prisons there would not prevent him from potentially taking his own life. Assange will appear on Wednesday at Westminster Magistrates Court in West London for a new bail application, where his legal team is expected to refer to conditions at Belmarsh High Security Prison in South London against the backdrop of the worsening COVID-19 pandemic. Legal experts say they would be surprised if bail is granted given Assange's categorization as a flight risk. Wearing a mask and a navy suit, the 49-year-old listened on Monday from the dock at the Central Criminal Court of England and Wales as the district judge, Vanessa Baratzer, initially knocked down arguments by his lawyers one after another and accepted the U.S. authorities' assertion that his alleged activities fell outside of the realm of journalism. But turning to evidence by medical experts about Assange's precarious mental health, she said the overall impression is of a depressed and sometimes despairing man who is genuinely fearful about his future. I find that the mental condition of Mr. Assange is such that it would be oppressive to extradite him to the United States of America, she concluded. So this is interesting to me. It's still a victory, and I'll take one where we can get it, but not a victory on the grounds that I had hoped for. Basically, he isn't getting extradited because the U.S. prison system is inadequate, because our system is worse than Britain, worse than the rest of the world. He's not winning this case on grounds that, you know, he actually is protected by the First Amendment of the United States Constitution. He is winning this case because we're terrible. So that to me is interesting, very interesting. So in other words, if the US prison system was better and could actually offer protection for Julian Assange, then he could have very well have been prosecuted under the Espionage Act because the allegation from the US government is that it's not just that WikiLeaks published Chelsea Manning's leaks, but that they helped her hack into U.S. encrypted uh, computers and, and actually get that information. They were part of this campaign. It was espionage. They took the information. They didn't just publish it. Now, it's interesting because I haven't heard this argument until they tried to extradite him because the case against Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning it has always been, uh, well, you know, you can't publish information about the U.S. government and evidence of our war crimes because this, uh, it hurts us when it comes to national security, whatever. They, they, you know, pull the national security card whenever it's convenient. But now they're saying, no, actually, Julian Assange, you hacked into our computers. You didn't just publish hacked information. So it's, it's really interesting that this case ended up being determined because the U.S. prison system is so cruel. Because when it comes to the substance, in the event they were able to prosecute Julian Assange under the Espionage Act, the precedent that this would set would have been horrific because any other journalist who wants to publish classified information, now that this is precedent, if it were precedent, they could just think, maybe I'll be better off just not publishing this because I could be prosecuted. The government can say that I'm a co-conspirator. I'm not just the publisher. I'm actually helping them acquire this information. They can make that argument. And the government can uh, use that against me. So I don't want to publish this. And that's bad. It's not just bad for journalism. It's bad because this is accountability, right? The media is supposed to be basically the fourth branch of government unofficially, where they hold government accountable. And as shitty as our media is, they still have to have the capability to be able to publish information about our government that the government does not want getting out, war crimes being one of them. So if you can't do that, and you're going to worry about retaliation from the US government by publishing dirt on them, that's bad. And this is what that uh, could have potentially produced. And it's not over because the appeal is uh is coming i don't know if the united states government can say well we have a special you know uh facility we'll send him to will he where he'll be protected i don't know i don't think it's over yet 
But I'm glad we got this victory, but it's just scary that we were this close to basically really taking a sledgehammer to the First Amendment. And it's sad that people don't realize what was at stake in this case. Like, people hate Julian Assange because of the 2016 Russia stuff. But this is not about that. This is about the Chelsea Manning leaks that proved our government is doing war crimes in Iraq and Afghanistan. And nobody thinks about the long-term repercussions of this case. They just kind of have this political hatred of Julian Assange. But this isn't about Julian Assange. This is about the broader precedent that this case would set. Like, you have to remove him from the situation. So, you know, it's a... Uh, it's very interesting, very, very interesting that this is ultimately how this case ended for now. But nonetheless, I'm happy about it. And this is a victory. And I'm going to celebrate this victory because had he been extradited to the United States and prosecuted, that would have been a new low for the United States. It would have been an attack on the First Amendment, unlike anything we've seen before. So I took a couple of weeks off from Twitter and YouTube and I come back and things are a complete mess. Um, you know, leaving <laughs> YouTube and Twitter, it, it really was nice. Like, it, it was therapeutic because I feel like my mind has been cleared. Uh, but every time, like, there's winter break, there's always some sort of drama that happens on left Twitter or YouTube. And this year, of course, was no different. I think back in 2017 or 2018, we had the Justice Democrats drama where they kicked out Jenk Uger and then Kyle Kalinske resigned as well. In 2019, we had the Tulsi Gabbard drama. Uh, I was part of that, unfortunately. Uh, and now we have the force the vote drama. Now, for those of you who are not aware, I'll try to give you the rundown of it. But basically, this turned into this really huge thing that has led to 50% of the left online hating the other 50% of the left online. And it seems like a large portion of people on left Twitter and YouTube now hate members of the squad because ultimately force the vote was not successful in getting them to get a floor vote on Medicare for all. It's kind of a mess, but I do feel like after watching way too many hours of force the vote uh, material, uh, I've listened to a lot of takes both from pr proponents of force the vote and people who are critical of it. I feel like I do have a pretty solid and objective perspective on this because I've heard out both sides. And so my observations are going to be based largely on generalizations. But I think that what I have to say, I think it's useful. And I, I kind of contemplated whether or not I should even talk about this because I don't I don't want to talk about something that is very clearly dividing the left, which hurts us overall. But I think that in order to move forward, there has to be healing. And in order to have healing, you have to talk about things like you can't just sweep it under a rug. So let's talk about it. So when it comes to force the vote, there's two main camps. One camp, as this uh, image explains, they just simply want progressives to withhold a vote for Nancy Pelosi to become Speaker of the House unless she agrees to, you know, get a floor vote on Medicare for all. Now, baked into this demand is this assumption that we know about the inevitability of Nancy Pelosi. We know that she's probably going to become speaker again because there's no other challenger to the left of Nancy Pelosi. Like, if it's not Nancy Pelosi, it's probably someone worse than Nancy Pelosi to the right of Nancy Pelosi, like Steny Hoyer or Hakeem Jeffries. Um, so knowing that she's going to be speaker again, try to get something out of it. Try to extract some concession, and the concession that we want is a floor vote on Medicare for All. We know it's not going to pass. We know this won't actually get us Medicare for All, but we think we can use this as ammunition to strengthen our position and, you know, have Democrats go on the record, like, show your cards. Who's going to go on the record and deny their constituents Medicare for All during a pandemic? So that's one side. The other side says, hmm... This isn't really a good idea. Now, I've heard multiple takes as to why they think this isn't a good idea. And I'll tell you which camp I fall in after I explain their position. But on Chop Out Trap House, Will Medicare made the point that, you know what? This is just going to hurt our cause because it's going to demoralize people. They're going to see Medicare for All fail and they're going to get disappointed and want to check out of politics. I'm paraphrasing, of course. There are some individuals who will say, you know what, this isn't a good idea because it's going to put us in a worse off position because then Nancy Pelosi can point to the failure of this to pass and she'll say, look, I told you it's not popular. We can't pass it. Um, so overall, after listening to all of these arguments, weighing out the pros and the cons, I ultimately do fall into the camp 
of Force the Vote. Ironically, I, I found out about Force the Vote through Sam Cedar when he talked about Jimmy Dore coming up with the strategy. And I thought, oh my God, this could be something that's amazing because if you have Jimmy Dore and Sam Cedar agreeing on something, two individuals who hate each other's guts, this really could be something that, you know, we all coalesce around and unify the left. But it's turned out to be like the opposite, where now everyone hates each other more than ever. And you see people online, Jen Uger, uh, Jimmy Dore, taking lots of shots against each other and it is getting ugly i mean that is hard to watch like i've watched these guys over the years and this is like watching two titans in our bubble in our echo chamber go at it it's like you know tupac versus biggie jay-z versus nas and so it's tough to watch and i don't think it needs to be this way. Uh, you know, I'm in the camp of force the vote. I think that this is a good strategy, but I think that we have to acknowledge that there are valid criticisms from allies who definitely support Medicare for all. But when things started to go downhill was when the factionalization really started to happen. There was a clip of Jimmy Dore basically screaming at AOC saying, you know, everyone is turning against you. Humanist Report is now uh, turning against you. Kyle Kalinske is turning against you. And my response to that is, you've got to calm the fuck down, Jimmy. <laughs> like, here's the thing. I don't like the criticisms that uh, Jimmy Dore is just doing this for clicks. He's a grifter. I believe Jimmy Dore believes in this. That's why he's angry. And look, he has a right to be angry. But you've got to acknowledge that if somebody sees, you know, Jimmy Dore screaming at AOC calling her a sellout, fuck you, you don't support the strategy, it's going to turn off a lot of people and think, okay, this doesn't seem like a good strategy if you're just going to yell at AOC. She's already on our side. From an optics perspective, from a marketing perspective, getting people on board means convincing them. And that's not going to be something that persuades a lot of people. And, you know, after seeing that, a lot of people thought, oh, wow, well, I, I don't want to be associated with this. I don't want to be associated with this dude online who's like screaming at people. And so you had individuals try to kind of salvage the force the vote campaign and say look this isn't really about jimmy Dore. this is really about force the vote the substance he's just one individual who is a proponent of force the vote and sure he popularized it but you don't have to agree with jimmy Dore and him screaming at aoc uh to still support force the vote and that was kind of my take like i think that anger is a good thing but i don't necessarily agree with like screaming at aoc um, I don't think that it's warranted just yet because I don't think that this necessarily proves that she's a sellout because she doesn't support this particular strategy. You know, there's just a disagreement and apparently her strategy was to negotiate with regard to Pago. But still, even having said that, I think that AOC is wrong to say that, oh, well, Jimmy Dore, she didn't name Jimmy Dore, but it's heavily implied that Jimmy Dore saying fuck you to her is tantamount to violence, which I unequivocally disagree with. Like, I, I think that Jimmy Dore went too far in his criticism of AOC, saying that she's basically uh, comparable to Nancy Pelosi, or there's no difference. I don't agree with that at all. But I don't think that telling a politician, fuck you, or to go fuck themselves, is tantamount to violence. But still, even if I don't agree with AOC saying that, I think that Jimmy Dore did take it a little bit too far at times. I think that, you know, when you have forced the vote and people aligning with you, uh, you, you have to acknowledge that there's going to be criticisms even within this faction that has kind of emerged. So there's another viral clip of Jimmy Dore and Ben Spielberg talking about this. And Ben Spielberg tried to push back against this claim that AOC and Pelosi are similar, I think. And Jimmy Dore was yelling at him and, and whatnot. I think that these clips kind of sullied the momentum for force the vote like you see a lot of solidarity but then you think okay i don't want to be associated with this it's getting a little bit too extreme too divisive but then people who support force the vote they started to see individuals who were initially supportive of it flip so you see uh jen Ugor, who kind of like indicated that he supports force the vote flip and is now critical of it, saying it's it's not the best strategy. Uh, you see Sam Cedar, who initially said he agreed with Jimmy Dore, kind of changed his tune a little bit. I don't know if he was still supportive of the strategy. Maybe he just didn't like Jimmy Dore's tactics and yelling, but he kind of flipped. You see, uh, you know, the DSA come out and say, we don't actually support this campaign, when I believe they supported a, a floor vote on Medicare for All a couple of years prior. So if you're an individual and you don't care about these viral clips and you, you care about the substance... Well, it's kind of like, what the fuck? You all supported it. What changed? I mean, now that it's gaining momentum after saying you support it, now you don't support it. So I see that anger. I see why people are disappointed. 
But on the opposite side of the same coin, folks who are disappointed with individuals who reject this strategy oftentimes take their criticisms way too far. You know, labeling someone a sellout because they don't support this is unreasonable. Putting someone on a list saying that these folks who rejected force the vote are on the wrong side of history, it doesn't make sense. These are all allies who support Medicare for All. They just don't agree with this particular strategy because they don't believe that it's the best way to get to Medicare for All. This is becoming like a no true Scotsman fallacy where it's like if you don't support force the vote, you're not a real progressive. When that's, it's a strategy disagreement. Like this isn't a hill to die on necessarily because it's just a strategy. I think folks who support force the vote know that this isn't actually going to get us to Medicare for all. It is just a means to an end. It could increase our bargaining power going forward. But of course, there are pitfalls with this strategy. I think there is insightful criticisms of it. But it's not like the hill to die on. Like if you don't support this, I don't support, I don't think you hate Medicare for all or you're a fraud progressive or a grifter. You just disagree and that's fine. Like, I've had my disagreements with people who support Medicare for All. I've been disappointed in, disappointed in Jimmy Dore, who, when Tulsi Gabbard came out against Medicare for All, you know, he kind of gave her this softball interview, and she supported a multi-payer system. She came out with, like, single-payer plus, and um, that's plus private insurance. So it's no longer single-payer. It's a multi-payer system. It doesn't eliminate, eliminate private insurance. And I was expecting Jimmy Dore to rip her a new asshole, but he didn't. So it's like, well, where was that energy? Where was that fire for Tulsi Gabbard when she came out against Medicare for All? Isn't this standard that you're applying to AOC a lot more stringent and harsh than other politicians? So there are disagreements there. And the problem is that when YouTubers and leftist pundits publicly disagree, then their audiences kind of end up taking a side, you know, and, and so that becomes this huge issue and it becomes a factionalized clusterfuck and, and just a mess. And you've got people who are like making fun of the small crowd size. And that really bothered me as well. If you look at like what the activists there were saying, one of them was Joy Marie, a friend of mine, like she was passionately talking about why she needed Med Medicare for all. So why would we make fun of that? If you disagree with the strategy, there's no need to make fun of that. Like we're all on the same side. And so basically like this is getting already too convoluted, but there's so much. Basically my, my main criticism of force the vote and all of this, like both sides, is that we don't communicate with each other. We're talking past each other. We're not talking to each other. And so if I vocalize a criticism of force the vote or, you know, I listen to a criticism of force the vote, rather than responding to someone else's criticism, I immediately shut down and I think, fuck that person. I'm done with them. I'm writing them off forever. And we do this individually because, you know, there's so much at stake, as I stated, like, there's a lot of anger and hurt and the necessity of Medicare for all, it's never been higher during a pandemic. So there's so much at stake and people have a right to be angry. We just have to make sure we're angry at the right people and being angry at each other, taking shots at each other. This isn't healthy and it doesn't help that YouTubers online are participating in this because their viewers are going to take sides and the viewers will clash when altogether we have to be a cohesive block if we ever want to be successful. And I'm preaching right now, but I've been part of the problem as well. I've gotten into many arguments with people online, uh, other leftist commentators. So we, we just have to try to be more self-aware and not do this. But the main issue here overall, if I could step back and wrap all of this in one pretty package and hand it to you and tell you this is what I think is the main issue here, it's a lack of communication. It's a lack of communication, not just with each other, but between us and politicians, members of the squad specifically, because this is what it's about. So fast forward to the day when all these members of Congress are sworn in and we see whether or not they're going to get anything for voting for Pelosi, because we all expected them to vote for Nancy Pelosi. And what happens? They voted for Nancy Pelosi and we didn't get a floor vote on Medicare for all. So a lot of people responded I think in a reasonable way by saying, look, I get it. You know, I don't want to see them vote for Nancy Pelosi. However, they're going to do that because there's no other left wing alternative. I just hope that they extracted enough concessions to make that vote worth it. Because by voting for Nancy Pelosi, like it or not, you're voting for someone who's part of the problem, who's against your interests. So if you're going to make that choice to vote for Nancy Pelosi, you better damn well get something for it. That's what Force the Vote was about. And then we saw a response that 
was the opposite, where Fraud Squad was trending and people were attacking members of the squad for voting for Nancy Pelosi. There's a lot to say about this. First of all, I think that labeling them the Fraud Squad, I think that that goes too far. But with that in mind, I don't think that anger at the squad is unwarranted. I think that anger at them voting for Nancy Pelosi, irrespective of the circumstances, they have to explain that. And this is where communication comes into play, right? Okay, I get that there was no other left-wing challenger and the only alternative to Nancy Pelosi was a Democrat that was more conservative, right? Someone like Hakeem Jeffries or uh, Steny Hoyer. So I get that. I can rationalize their, their reasoning. And if they feel as if, you know, getting the uh, exceptions for Medicare for All and the Green New Deal under PAYGO to then force a floor vote on Medicare for All later, if they think that's enough, then that's fine. Like, I don't think voting for Nancy Pelosi makes them sellouts. If I were in Congress, would I vote for Nancy Pelosi? No, I would not. I would make sure I rally enough protest votes to make a big enough noise without making us susceptible to getting an even more conservative speaker like Steny Hoyer or Hakeem Jeffries. Uh, but that's just me. But if they took the time and explained it to us, explained it to people, this wouldn't be that big of an issue. Do they go too far in saying they're the fraud squad who are critical of their votes for Pelosi? Yes. I even saw some people say, like, we need to primary the squad and, um, that just is nonsensical because why waste your energy and, you know, a limited amount of resources and organizational power on primarying them when there are Democrats who are way worse? There are Republicans who are worse. So, you know, I, I think that that is too far. There's some people who were just like overly attacking Cori Bush on her first day in Congress when you also have Marjorie Taylor Greene being sworn in. And why isn't your fire being directed towards her? She definitely doesn't support Medicare for all. So, you know, that's my feelings. But I'm also conflicted because when people run on something, like the expectations are higher, like the standards for the squad are higher, right? So I expect better from them. So if they let me down, I'm going to be more disappointed than by something that Marjorie Taylor Greene does or some other corporate Democrat does because I expect better from them. So here's the thing. Basically, if they voted for Nancy Pelosi and then explained themselves, that would be really, really helpful. It would make it so that way disillusionment and disappointment with the squad wouldn't be as severe. Because here's the thing. If you're going to make this vote, we all kind of expected them to make this vote. You've got to take the time to explain yourselves. But they vote for Nancy Pelosi and then they expect people to, to just accept. Well, we had no other option. But explain that to us. Like if you're going into Congress and you're Cory Bush and you support all the policies that we support, you can't just vote for Nancy Pelosi and then like never touch on that. Like if I did like a 30 second ad in Lo for Lockheed Martin on this show, a defense contractor, and then just never addressed it again, you guys would be like, what the fuck? Why are you doing this? What you just did is antithetical to everything that you stood for. So you'd have to explain yourself. And I think that maybe if I came up with some excuse or whatever, that would at least let you know my thinking. But we know, like, if you are a member of the squad, you know that Nancy Pelosi is antithetical to everything that you stand for. You know she's a fraud. So you can't just vote for her and not expect people to be angry. You have to explain your vote for Nancy Pelosi. Communicate with people. You have large platforms. You can go basically on any channel. My channel, uh, the, the Young Turks, Kyle Kalinske, David Dole. You can go on any channel and explain yourself. You basically have an open invitation. But this isn't even about leftist commentators. You could just upload a video to YouTube explaining, look guys, I understand why you're frustrated. Nancy Pelosi does not represent what I like, but I had to vote for her because that was the only way I could get X, Y, and Z. I could get this committee appointment, this concession. So I hope you can understand that I had to make this decision begrudgingly, but it's what I think can best improve my position in Congress to have more bargaining power. Like if you explain it to people, that would make matters a lot better, but there's no communication. They make the vote and people are scratching their heads wondering why you just voted for Nancy Pelosi. And perhaps, again, the reasons are valid because there isn't another option that's more left wing than Nancy Pelosi. But explain to us what happened, why she's the speaker again, why during the last two years that you had, you didn't find the time to rally around someone else who's to the left of Nancy Pelosi, especially now that you have more leverage when the House just lost ground. Like you you just kind of like accepted Nancy Pelosi as an as an inevitability. So I want you to explain to us what happened. 
And it's not like they're forced to explain themselves to me. Like they don't have to come on the humanist report every single time they do something bad or that I disagree with. But if you want people who helped you get to Congress still be dedicated to you and, and fight for you and be loyal to you, you do have to clue them in on these things. You have to explain these things because we're not going to be privy to all of these small little legislative maneuvers and backroom deals that go on that leads to the things that are disappointing. So you just got to explain it to us. Like what we need from members of the squad is reassurance that what we're doing is, is worthwhile. Getting more progressive members elected to Congress is worthwhile. Phone banking for them, canvassing for them, uh, you know, sending them money, that it's all worthwhile. Because if every time we elect someone and we primary a corporate Democrat successfully, you just turn around and do what the establishment wants, like people are going to get demoralized and the squad isn't going to grow as easily. So you've got you've to help us help you. The online left is just like one component of the overall left collective in the United States. But like it or not, they did get you elected. They helped you get elected. So you can't just make them feel as if once you're elected, that institution is going to change you. You have to explain to us that everything that we've been doing for the last couple of years, you know, it wasn't for nothing. You still know that Nancy Pelosi is the enemy and you let us know, you clue us in on these things. But like, there's a lot of things that kind of add up and people think it's trivial, but I don't think it is trivial. Like you see Na uh, Nancy Pelosi be called Mama Bear by AOC. Uh, you see AO or, or Ilhan Omar sharing an endorsement of Nancy Pelosi and what she said about Ilhan Omar. It's like, you can't, you can't do that and not make people upset because Nancy Pelosi is a barrier to progress. And if you really believe in everything that you say you believe in, which I believe you do, then you can't keep normalizing Nancy Pelosi. If you're going to vote for Nancy Pelosi, take the time to explain to people why she's part of the problem, why it's not just Republicans who are stopping us from getting Medicare for all. It is individuals in the Democratic Party's leadership that do that as well. But still, having said that, though, it doesn't mean that if you vote for Nancy Pelosi, you're a sellout or if you call her mama bear or, you know, you share her endorsement of you. That doesn't mean you're a sellout. It irritates me to no end. It does, but it doesn't mean you're a sellout. So I kind of see like both sides here. Like I see them going too far in saying they're the fraud squad, but also the anger and disappointment with the squad, it it really is warranted. Like there's so much at stake, even if I'm misguided and the, the squad really is behind the scenes doing everything in their power to get us in a better position, the communication there is lacking. And we have to talk. But I want to end with this. Everyone who was involved in Force the Vote, whether you supported it or you don't support it, everyone has good intentions here. Everyone is passionate because they believe this will either help or hurt our chances of securing Medicare for All further down the road. Because nobody believed this would lead to us getting Medicare for All. It just was a means to an end eventually. Maybe. But at the end of the day, we all support Medicare for All. And we're mad because we care. And that sounds corny, but it's true. Like, we're mad at each other. We're taking shots at each other because so much is at stake. And the left, you know, it seems like we're unreasonable and we're crazy because we're always, like, fighting each other and shitting on each other and dunking on each other. But that isn't just unhinged behavior. I mean, well, sometimes it is. But <laughs> that energy is there because people care. People's lives are at stake. People need Medicare for all. We need free college. We need a Green New Deal. So whenever, you know, the stakes are that high, emotions and tensions are going to be high as well. And we have to remind ourselves of that. Of that. And I feel like if I didn't like take this break from Twitter, I would probably be like right in the trenches, like staking out a position, arguing with everyone else, because that's just how human beings are. Like we, we say we support something and then somebody responds. And rather than trying to, you know, uh, interpret what they're saying from the position of a good faith ally, we kind of like harden our stance and we take shots at them and we feel attacked personally when that's that's not the case. Like the force to vote people, they have to acknowledge that the people who didn't agree with the strategy are not sellouts. But I think that tensions wouldn't be as high if political commentators like myself didn't fan the flames. Like I feel like all of this has kind of led to me coming to this conclusion that political commentary online is, is like a double-edged sword. On one hand, I think it is important because we 
I think, I hope, provide a service in simplifying political news and giving you, like, an interesting take and offering you commentary that is insightful. But on the other hand, you know, like it or not, these personalities kind of become larger than life and people end up supporting the personality over the substance. So, you know, you, you see, like, when these personalities clash you know the audiences will clash and it becomes about the personality and not the issues and so i hope that like folks like jimmy Dore and jen uger will stop taking shots at each other publicly for the betterment of the movement and like work this out privately but i feel like we all have to try to be more understanding of each other and empathetic and acknowledge that we're all good faith actors come coming from a position that um it's like well-intentioned well, that's everything. Hopefully you enjoyed the program. Thank you so much for tuning in if you've made it this far in the program. Uh, as usual, I want to thank all of the people who make this show possible, all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members. You all are absolutely just incredible, and I really can never tell you, uh, express how much you mean to me and how much you help the show not just to survive, but actually thrive. Like, you all are just so incredible. So uh, thank you so much. Um, but yeah, that's it. I, I feel like if I keep talking, I'm just going to ramble. So I will see you all Next week, um, this has been The Humanist Report. I'm Mike Figueredo. I already need, need another break. <laughs> Take care, everyone.